For years, Friends of Cancer Research annual meeting has assembled teams of changemakers to work on pressing challenges affecting the development of cancer therapies. This approach unites scientists, clinicians, advocates, and policymakers to devise strategies for overcoming challenges and accelerating new treatments for patients. The output of this work, developed through multi-stakeholder partnerships, supports policy change surrounding impediments to the field of oncology. The critical topics discussed during these meetings initiate solutions leading to groundbreaking advances in cancer care. In 2008, we focused on the co-development of diagnostics and therapeutics, initiating conversations in the community that have ultimately provided FDA with the tools to approve targeted therapies, accompanied by a companion diagnostic test, improving patient care and access. In 2011, we challenged stakeholders to consider a new path for drugs with large treatment effects seen early. As a result, the breakthrough therapy designation went from concept to scientific white paper to bipartisan legislative solution to an expedited FDA pathway for life-changing therapies. Panelists came together in 2012 to propose how clinical trials can work better for patients. The umbrella trial, now known as LungMap, became a timely trial to match a patient to targeted therapies. And in 2018, leaders in the field mapped out approaches to identifying and establishing the role of circulating tumor DNA, ctDNA, in cancer drug development. These discussions led to new approaches to optimize the use of biological markers. As science and technology continue to evolve, collaboration is critical to support the next generation of breakthrough treatments into cancer care. And today, that work for patients continues. Good morning. We've been around for a long time, and I think hopefully doing some good things, but with all of you. Um, welcome to this meeting. This is the 16th annual meeting. Um, it promises to be important, and uh, I want to thank everyone for participating, for coming, and being part of it. Your support and involvement means a, a, a great deal to us. To kick off this meeting, we have a discussion moderated by Jeff Allen, I'll talk about that in a second, with the newly minted NIH director, Monica Bertinelli. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. Finally, finally, took too long, but she's here now, and we all know Dr. Califf, and uh, we also know that they are gonna be working well together, so I am very excited about it. Uh, we are talking about clinical trials, um, about, Ten years ago, I said I'm, I was never going to a clinical trials meeting ever again, uh, and I said because we always talk about it and nothing seems to change, and we really need to make things change. We have the science now, and I do want to stress it's the role of everyone. Uh, it's the role to look at ourselves. Um, uh, certainly, NIH and FDA, you're looking at the advancement of trials and care about it, uh, you have to look at your own systems, your own bureaucracy, your own impediments, uh, and clarity of message is really important. To all the drug developers, it's really important that you not burden these trials with unnecessary data that won't make a difference. We have to make them accessible to patients all over, and that's important. And we have to remember this is for patients. So um, this is why we're doing this, and patients are waiting for us to get our own act together and to get simpler, more meaningful trials to, uh, to them. Uh, Jeff, will, Jeff Allen, the president of Friends, will be moderating. Jeff and I always have this thing. He's the brains and I'm the brawn, so, um, so now, <laughs> brains, you can figure out what you can do here with these people. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bella. Thank you, Ellen Braun. <laughs> no pressure, but. Um, well, thank you all for uh, joining the meeting today, both in person and for people that are viewing online. We appreciate you uh, being here for our 16th annual meeting. 
Uh, we hope that this meeting, as Ellen alluded to, is the opportunity to bring together uh, scientists from various different sectors, advocates, policymakers, researchers, in order to determine and identify potentially action-oriented steps. Um, as Ellen said, today's meeting is largely focused on clinical trials, um, where we hope we'll be able to uh, present some information that a number of working groups have worked very hard at over the last several weeks, and we, we thank them for that, um, related to topics such as dose-finding strategies, pragmatic trials, and efficiencies in data management. Um, we are thrilled to have uh, Dr. Rob Califf, the Commissioner of the FDA, joining us, and our new NIH Director, Dr. Monica Bergnoli, um, two people who uh, you really couldn't find better folks to uh, weigh in on these topics. Um, I know we'll have the chance to cover a number of different things today. Um, but really, um, let's just dive in. Maybe we can have a little bit of fun, um, and uh, we look forward to uh, hearing your insights. Um, but maybe just to start level setting uh, for the meeting today, um, obviously both of you have um, a great deal of experience throughout your careers with the clinical trial system in oncology, outside of oncology. But Monica, maybe we can um, start with you. Um, can you just give us a sense of you know, wh what is the state of play in clinical trials? Where, where are we at? What are some of the challenges that are, are, are still facing the system as a whole? Yeah. Well, I mean, everyone knows that clinical trials have to live in our clinical care environment. That's the point. And we all know the great challenges that our clinical care environment has. We see it every single day. And um, I think maybe to put a different a, a spin on the conversation from the start is that clinical trials have to serve the needs of the doctor and the patient who sit in a room together and are trying to figure out what is the best thing to do for that patient. And that patient is a complicated person with maybe not just a cancer, but a cancer and cardiovascular disease. They might be elderly, they might be an adolescent, they might live in a community where it's really hard to get to care, you know, et cetera, all these things we know. And the thing I think that we have to finally take the leap to do is to design our evidence generation in a way that really does do much more to help that doctor and that patient make those decisions together. So uh, you can see I'm not talking about one single, even one single disease, one single treatment, but how do we put this whole picture together for all, all people? And it's, that's a tall order, but the last thing I'll say is uh, we can do this. It's going to take a radical change in the way we think about trials, about trial system, and about the, how the clinical care environment can be used as a learning laboratory. But that's what we want, that's what we need to do. Rob, same situation outside of oncology. Have you seen successes in terms of bringing evidence generation closer to clinical care? <laughs> Let's see, how do I answer this politically correctly? Um, I can't, so. <laughs> um, what, first of all, we have to acknowledge that, as, as Monica said, clinical trials are complicated. So a lot of times you hear people talk about it, and we're always talking about simplification, which I greatly believe in. But the fact is we're doing experiments involving human beings, and there's nothing simple about that. It um, requires a group to work together and come to consensus where there are differences of opinion across the board. Um, it's, it's quite, if you look at the sociology of clinical trials, it's an amazing exercise you have to go through to come up with a common protocol given all the differences that Monica referred to, which are very real. At, at least right now, I feel like the theory of how to bring evidence into practice and practice into evidence is very far advanced mm -hmm. during the course of my career. The practice is actually headed the opposite direction right now. And so it may take a cancer surgeon actually to overcome this, someone who goes up against the odds and has confidence uh, that we can do it. And I'm, I'm totally with it. I think everybody knows that. I think the FDA wants to put it, all of its weight into helping to make this happen because it's really, really needed. As long as clinical trials are seen as an expensive add-on that detracts from a clinician's time in the patient and gives the administrator a pain in the neck and causes institutions to be 
completely concerned about liability as opposed to answering the questions that are relevant to practice and to their institutional decisions and insurance companies to make it hard for people to participate as a matter of policy. As long as that goes on, uh, we're not going to get there. And all those things are in play right now. We're going to have to come up with policies that overcome them. So with all those barriers in mind, it's been, I think, probably an accurate estimate that for decades at this point, the participation of adult cancer patients in clinical trials or the enrollment has hovered around 5% of all cancer patients. Is that the reality for the foreseeable future? Um, do we need to just come to terms with that as going to be the enrollment rate and we need to find other ways for evidence generations or are there things that we can be doing better in order to actually move the needle on that number? So I'll start with this one and, and yeah, I'm aware of that figure, but I'm also aware of a figure that's happened over the last decade where if you just look at the number of patients who go on trials, and you look at the number of patients who go on government-funded trials, it's been completely flat over the last decade. If you go and look at the number of people who go on pharma-sponsored trials, it's just had this tremendous increase. And the ratio, you know, so the ratio is getting worse and worse and worse. This is great. I mean, pharma is producing amazing results for us, and wouldn't want to wouldn't want to de-emphasize that in any way, but we've got to get the trials out and funded and available that are answering all those questions that are not of central interest to pharma. That, to me, is one of the places where we're the most critically behind. Well, I, <clears throat> I mean, it's an interesting question. What is the right proportion of people to be in clinical trials? And I think, at least the way I see it, um, it, it, it if we change it to evidence generation from clinical trials the way we standardly think of them, I would hope we can approach 100% because mm -hmm. we know with technology where it is today, there's no reason we can't have quality assessment, um, observational analysis of what's working and what's not going 100% of the time, humming in the background because the technology's there to do it and most industries work that way. And then when there's a question that needs to be answered through randomization and a clinical trial, you insert that into a system. And, you know, we don't need 100% of people to do that. We need the right number to get the answers. You also got to consider that the U.S. is 4% of the world's population. There are 8 billion people in the world. We're 340 million or so. And so uh, we need a global evidence generation system, but I would point out those industry-funded trials that Monica's talking about. I see Dr. Pastor sitting up there. He may opine on this later, but from what I'm hearing, even in oncology now, we're seeing a migration of um, industry-funded trial enrollment out of the U.S. into other countries. That happened in my field of cardiology 20, 25 years ago. It would be wrong to enroll 100% of people in the U.S. with 4% of the world's population, but we need to come to grips with the fact that although pharma is doing a great job of getting their trials done, um, U.S. may not be the preferred place to enroll when you really talk to the people. Right. One other point I want to make, which I think is really important and germane to a lot of things that are going to happen today because we're going to get our evidence generation recommendations from the Reagan Udall Foundation this afternoon. I think if you look at um, phase one through three clinical trials, the system, in general, works pretty darn well. 90% of drugs don't make it to market because the trial system weeds them out where there's toxicity. You wouldn't want to wait until millions of people are treated to figure that out, so the system's doing that part of it really well. Where we really don't have a system that works is post-market, where NIH has such a huge role, uh, potentially, and we'll see what the director chooses to do. Um, all these questions that are left on the table after FDA approval, how does it compare to other treatments? How do you combine treatments? How long should you treat? You know, my mom had multiple myeloma and she was rescued by an accelerated approval, but no one could answer the question, do you just keep giving it forever or when do you stop? And it's understandable that um, industries for profit, there's not um, an incentive to answer a lot of these questions. 
this is a matter where we all as an ecosystem uh, need to work together and it's also a place where uh, we can simplify quite a bit because we've already answered in phases one through three those critical questions about any possible side effect or toxicity because we collect all that data. We don't need to keep collecting it, you know, when the 10,000th patient has been entered into a clinical trial and we can then reduce the cost, make it simpler, make it easier for patients and clinicians to participate. So you're going to, you'll hear a lot about that this afternoon from Reagan Udall and I hope we'll really take that seriously. And from your vantage point, you described earlier on, uh, you know, some of the uh, silos that have uh, been built across the healthcare system that makes um, evidence generation and clinical research a challenge. Um, but it very much sounds like you two are on the same page here moving forward. Um, so do you have any thoughts that you could share with us about ways that FDA and NIH could um, collaborate even stronger um, than they do already? Well, there's not a better example going on right now than Pragmatica, which I'll let Monica describe. I, it's fairly well known that Dr. Passer and I, you know, typically have like every month or every other month we have a dinner where we mostly argue about which is better, cardiology or oncology. But <laughs> um, we also, uh, these ideas were discussed in Hatch. Monica joined us for some sessions and I, I think both sides have really worked hard and I think it's going well from what I hear. Yeah. No, and, and I, I think you all know, um, we talked about it last year as just an idea, but it's now in operation that NCI now has a clinical trials innovation unit that's cl collaboration between Rick's team, um, members of the NCI, people from the NCI, and the chairs of the national, cl the clinical trials network uh, groups, the group chairs, and uh, that team is working together, and they're doing really hard work. Um, because innovation is really difficult, and um, it's exciting to see the ideas that have come. Some come and they're running with, others that got rejected. Got rejected. I mean, I think it's a really great think tank, and I can tell you, you know, I'm not at liberty to say what's coming out soon, but I can tell you I think that the ideas that that team is working on are truly transformative. Why haven't you seen them sprouting already? It's because these are transformative ideas and take some significant spade work even to get going. But I'm thrilled to see what this group has started to do and we hope to continue to see more. But you know, Jeff, you asked um, where have I seen this work before? I, so in some ways, I think you're rediscovering what we knew in the 1980s, but then we've lost track of it for reasons mm. that are really sort of hard to explain. But you know that in the 1980s, we were reeling off trials of 10 to 40,000 patients routinely in cardiology using very streamlined, like the biggest one I started with, the Gusto trial, was three pages on the case record form. It led to a FDA indication, was greatly defended by the FDA as the right way to do the trial. So we're relearning that, but we got to get rid of a lot of stuff. And I want to make a, what I think is, again, one of the most important points. We're not talking about early drug development or even up to the first indication for most situations. That has to be a very detailed system to collect everything because you don't know what you're going to find when you put a new molecule or a new device in a, in a human being. We're talking about later on, um, we need to do things differently to make them um, better. And I, I think when people like me in the past have railed on about the clinical trial system, how it needs to be simplified, I think there's been confusion thinking that we were talking about those earlier phases and we need to make that really clear. I think that system works well and I don't think we want to mess with it too much. But the one area that Monica may want to talk about, I do think there's an exception to what I just said for oncology and rare disease where for most of the common like cardiometabolic diseases, for example, there's not the precision that you have of these um, markers that identify small subpopulations where you've really got to think about very different kinds of designs early on. Mm -hmm. So also don't want to be misinterpreted as saying all of that needs to be cookie cutter. I think this is an area of great um, activity and ferment now. If we look at gene editing happening in all diseases now, um, 
it's, it's another example. So that needs to be worked on. But the post market is the biggest part of what we're talking about here. So I can give you an example of um, a beginning of building the infrastructure that I think we're going to need. Um, remember, we need data that really speaks to the doctor and the patient, you know, there in the room together. Well, there's a project ongoing at NCI. It's called CC Direct. Sorry, I never remember what all the letters are for. What this is designed, and, and one of the things that NCI has really done successfully recently is build a community around the use of data, pediatric cancer data. So the, can the, the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative is not only about bringing data together, it's about bringing the community of people who are using the data together. So there's a new project, CC Direct, that's come out of that, that is trying to dramatically expand that community in a dynamic way that can facilitate um, knowledge. So what does it do? It's got, it's got three major components. Component one is it is a permissioning. We don't say consent. It's a permissioning based on the parent saying, I give you permission to have access to my child's medical record for as long as you want it. Um, as you know, this means that now in December, when the law finally goes into effect, you know that any health system is going to be required to submit that record based on the permissioning we get from the, the parent. Um, number two, when that record comes in, there's a core team working on turning that record into a standardized health record that serves the needs of a pediatric cancer patient, that all the data that we need to be able to evaluate and treat that child. And then the third part of it, which is really important to give back to the patients that we're working with, is a navigation service to make sure that this child is getting to the people they need um, in order to treat them. It has a, a, migration, a, a graduation program when the child turns 18, because you know, at losing kids at, at adulthood, often they our survivors fall off the end. And so the idea is to create a system that allows us access to all kids who agree to participate with pediatric cancers. And then there's an additional consent that every child's family can agree to, which says, if there's any research relevant to our child, can, can we recontact you? And so they get plugged into the Childhood Molecular Cancer Data Initiative. Any child with a rare tumor is automatically <coughs> plugged in to a network that allows them to be approached and identified when a new treatment comes on board. So this, is, this, has been, this pro team has been working. They've made tremendous progress on the permissioning, on the standard health record format, and on the navigation. And we'll see this roll out over the next two years for kids. Um, why did we pick kids? We picked kids because 13,000 new diagnoses a year. It's something we can get our arms around. And it's nationwide. It's not only major academic medical centers, kids with cancer are, come from everywhere. So we're really reaching the most distributed possible population to build these new tools. And I'll just say finally, we're going to have this data learning network now based on, I would love to see this, we hope to see this successful work out of a lot of kinks, and then we want to see it go to scale, pilot and scale, go to the next population where we start pulling in the data required to create a learning health system. It sounds like this is <clears throat> absolutely operationalizing the things that you started with around bringing the research closer to the normal functioning between the physicians and the patients. A absolutely, and the other really critical part is it's all, it, kids get into this because of a doctor-patient relationship that it, they have built, and it allows us to maintain that doctor-patient relationship, but also put the kids and their parents in charge, not dependent on wherever they might happen to land, and that's very helpful. Yeah. Rob, on the, on the post-market side of things, that sort of uh, void of information or you know, the delinking that you described from thinking about that just um, as or not mixing that up with the phase one through three trials. Um, when you think about research in the, in the pr practice and healthcare practice, 
what role do you think CMS has to play? <laughs> um, I, let me expand that to payers in general, but CMS obviously is a special payer. Um, I think that there are little things that uh, policy-wise that CMS can think about. I actually don't want to get into details right now because we want to preserve the ability to, now that uh, Monica's on board, we want to preserve the ability to have some internal discussions. But I would just say um, I wouldn't expect payers to run the research activities, but if they ask the question, what can we do every day to make it more likely that we get the answers to the questions we need to know what to pay for and what to get rid of? I mean, remember, we're spending $4.3 trillion, and I'm not asking for tears right now, but male life expectancy in the U.S. hit 73 last year. There's just a paper yesterday showing that. It's going in that direction. Women live to be 79. The gap is widening, but combined, we're in last place in high-income countries now in health outcomes and uh, headed the wrong direction, and we're spending $4.3 trillion. So imagine if we actually knew what worked and what didn't, and we knew comparatively where to spend our money, what an impact we could have uh, on health and longevity. Now, this is not, not all just about drugs and devices or medical care, but um, I, I think there's a lot to be said for um, having the evidence we need to know what to focus on given the situation that we're currently in. But, um, you know, so far I've found that any time we have a question that needs to be answered uh, that's really relevant to practice, if we don't make it hard, clinicians are very excited about participating and um, a very high proportion of people will volunteer if they're asked in that light. You know, and I, I can also add that, you know, relevant to CMS, but relevant to all of HHS, we cannot do the research we need to do without deeply engaging, understanding, and uh, motivating the health systems. You know, we absolutely have to deeply understand the health systems in their great variability. Um, throughout this country if we're going to do, deliver what the patients need. So for me, you know, thousands and thousands of great research questions, but every single one of those questions we have to view through, okay, who are we trying to engage? And that means which health system are we trying to get into to make it possible to do that research? I'll just say finally that one of the things in my new, new role I'm very uh, interested in is we have a lot of really, really challenged communities that we need to get into. We need to get into for oncology. You don't show up in a place that is just so dear to my heart, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, where the, a man's life expectancy is 49 and a woman's is 53, the worst in the nation. You don't walk into Pine Ridge and say, hey, we're, you know, we're the NCI, we're here, we wanna do uh, clinical trials and say we're only here for cancer. You have to walk into those communities and be there for every single health issue that that community needs you to support. This is frankly one of the reasons why I'm thrilled to be working with Rob and I'm thrilled to be at NCI because if we're gonna succeed for cancer in these places, we have to bring everything. And, and then finally, you know, we had an IC directors meeting um, my first one, right, which was really exciting because I looked around the room and I said, okay, anybody in this room, is there anybody in this room who isn't worried about obesity? Anybody? You know, and, and the answer is really no. You know, even, even believe it or not, the Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, is now got really interesting data, which we've been talking about, showing that heavily processed foods are addictive. You know, so, so those kinds of issues that are really, truly relevant to cancer, we need to tackle across all the agencies. Jeff, just one, you asked about insurance, so let me talk about private insurance for one second and something that happened. I got um, asked by AHIP, the, the plans, to go to their annual meeting, and the question they had for me was, explain why you're not getting those post-accelerated approval studies done more quickly. Mm. My answer was, you tell me what you're doing to help get them done, because when I talk to clinicians, they say the number one impediment to getting the studies done is the requirements of the insurance companies. 
Now, you know, there's a, there's a phrase Monica and I also are talking about that I love. <laughs> Blame is toxic, accountability um, is necessary. Okay. And so I'm not blaming the health insurance companies, but we all ought to be asking what can we do uh, to contribute to turning these things around. Well, before we wrap up, let me ask you guys both uh, w one more question. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Rob, um, since you've had a little bit more time to think about this. Um, but I can only imagine that your, your roles um, are oftentimes perhaps unpredictable and encountering issues that you may not have even thought you'd encounter that day. Um, but as you think about um, you know, the, the tenure leading your respective agencies, what, what's one thing that you want to be sure that you don't take your eye off of? I, people around me know this. It's, uh, I bug the heck out of people about our decline in life expectancy and all the things that go with it. And so you say, okay, keep your eye on it, but it's not really the FDA's primary responsibility right, but I think we ought to be asking the question every day, what are we contributing uh, to turning this around and for example things come to mind like we have entire areas like when was the last time you saw a modern product for tobacco cessation we're going to lose almost 500,000 Americans this year to tobacco related illness um, we need more treatments for addiction uh, mental health is not going great in terms of new product development um, so that's really the thing for me is we're a public health agency and um, there are a gazillion things we need to do every day. I actually feel pretty good about the, our center directors are doing a great job of doing those things. But in aggregate, this is the thing that um, I think we got to just not forget because it's easy to say it's really not our problem. We do our job well. Don't worry about the rest of it. So, so I led with mine. I mean, it really is. I, I'm a clinician, you know. I, it's not so long I sat in clinic. Um, and realize, you realize every time you're there that you're, the data you're operating on, the knowledge that you're using, so little of it is really, truly, absolutely solid. You know, you're operating with uh, incomplete data constantly. And we do pretty well because our clinicians are, you know, dedicated and dedicated to their patients, but we could do so much better with better evidence. And I want to get the kind of evidence that helps those doctors and patients to make their decisions together. And we're, it's a hey, big We're test. together on that. I always <laughs> said it's, you know, I, I, if I'm sick, I want to have a great doctor, but I'd rather have a great doctor armed with high quality evidence. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's what we're lightning focused on. And, and it does not underplay in any way. In fact, it magnifies the importance of fundamental science, it magnifies the importance of technology, and it magnifies the importance of our health system. And I think at, and I, you know, at NIH, we do research, we don't do care delivery, but it's still got to be a big concern for us. And who else is going to help understand how you make those outcomes better? I could have sworn Monica said she was going to make research fun again. It is so. fun. <laughs> All right, good. You, you can come with me to Pine Ridge and you'll find out how much fun it is. It's fabulous. Just get in the clinic. It's wonderful. Well, thank you guys very much for, for joining us today, for everything that you're doing. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, but I think we can be certain that um, we are in very good hands with the two of you, and I uh, really appreciate your, your time today and, and going forward. So thank you very much. Appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we will uh, begin transitioning to our uh, first session today. Um, as we do begin, I want to start just by thanking all of the panelists that you'll hear from uh, at today's meeting. Um, each of them are representatives from uh, working groups that, as I mentioned, have been working together over the last couple of months to develop a series of white papers that will be the basis of their presentations today. Um, at your seats, you should have um, some summaries of those white papers uh, with the documents that were uh, left there. Each of those is actually an executive summary for a larger document, so I would invite you to scan the QR code on there for access to the full documents um, that will be 
uh, presented today. They also are available on our website and will be available after the meeting um, more broadly. Um, during today's meeting, um, if you are joining us virtually today, uh, please submit any questions that you have for our panelists in the Zoom chat and follow along on X and LinkedIn using the hashtag FriendsAM23. Uh, the questions that you supplied will be transmitted to our, our moderators to work into the uh, panel discussions as time permits. Um, for those of you that are here in person today, you'll see that there will be um, mics available in the aisle for uh, questions. Um, if you have questions for our panelists, we kindly ask that you identify yourself, uh, keep your questions succinct, and preferably relevant to the topics at hand. Um, so up next, I would like to turn things over to our first panel discussion today entitled Early Phase Trial, Data, Im Data Implementation and Interpretation for Dosed Finding. Um, so I'll hand things over to Julie Bullock, who will be moderating this panel today. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so hi, and good morning, everyone. I'm Julie Bullock. Um, I am a senior vice president at Sertara's uh, consulting division, and I am honored today to be moderating the panel for early phase trials, data implementation, and interpretation for dose finding. So I'm going to briefly introduce uh, the panelists and friends that I have up here on the stage with me. So to my left, I have Judith Fitzgerald, a patient advocate. I have Ramon Kemp, uh, Vice President, Head of Oncology EDL and Interim Head of Oncology MDL at GSK. I have Enrique Sanz Garcia, a medical oncologist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center and an Assistant Professor at the University of Toronto. I have Marat Shah, a medical oncologist at the US FDA. And I have, uh, last but not least, uh, Jitha Najaraza Singham, um, who is the Associate Professor of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and a consultant in the Division of Hematology at the Lymphoma Group. Um, so thank you all for joining me today. Uh, we will be discussing the, the white paper that we worked on in our working group. Um, and before that, I'll just give a brief introduction with regards to the white paper. Um, you know, it's an honor to be included not only in the working group discussions, but also in the panelists today because I've been a very vocal advocate for the need to improve dose finding and dose optimization in our early clinical trials for um, over the past 10 years. Um, and with that, not only do we need to think differently about how we approach our early study designs, but we have to think differently in the data that we collect, and we need to look at the data that we collect to make decisions. And that's really what the focus of this white paper has been on, is it's about the data collections and what we need to establish that totality of evidence um, for our dose decisions and how best to make those decisions. We also spent a lot of time within the group and our discussions emphasizing uh, tolerability as an inclusion of data to, um, because that data is kind of new to us in the oncology space and looking past the DLT criteria is something that we haven't historically done and it's, it's novel to the dose decision. Um, we did not go into too many discussions about study designs or statistics. We found that there was enough in the field uh, with regards to, to study designs and statistics, and that, that, that topic is emerging quite nicely. Uh, so instead, we focused really on the data um, and how we should be looking at that data to make decisions. <coughs> um, so with that, uh, let's get started. Uh, so I think my first question goes to, to Murat. So, uh, what were the FDA's goals and intent for Project Optimus? Thanks for the question, and it's my absolute pleasure to be part of this working group and to be on the panel today. So uh, Project Optimus was established by the Oncology Center of Excellence in 2001 with the goal of reforming the oncology drug dosing paradigm. And the reform we wanted to see is that oncology drug dosages should be optimized prior to drug approval. The reason this reform is needed is because Currently, often oncology drug dosages are inadequately characterized prior to drug approval, and this can have negative consequences for patients. Some of those consequences can include that oncology, drug dose, oncology drugs may be poorly tolerated, that they're approved dosages, or those dosages might be associated with avoidable toxicity, and sometimes that avoidable toxicity can be severe and even negatively impact things like overall survival. 
Um, so over the past couple of years, we've had multiple public multi-stakeholder uh, stakeholder discussions, excuse me, like this one, including um, in this forum in past years. And I really think that over that period of time, there is growing alignment among stakeholders on the need for dosage optimization. A lot of those early conversations were about why this is needed. Um, I think the conversation is shifting now to not why this is needed. I think we all generally agree, but how to actually achieve dosage optimization prior to drug approval. Some of those questions are, how do we look at the data to decide which dosages to evaluate? How do we design trials to evaluate those dosages? And I think those are some of the questions that my colleagues and I on the panel are interested in discussing today. I do wanna point out that there are many patients and oncology providers who have been advocating for more attention to oncology drug dosages for a long time prior to project Project Optimus, and this is really a movement towards dosage optimization that is built on kind of the, the input and the, and the communications we've had with Asian, patients and oncology providers over the past five, 10 years. Very good. Thank you, Marat. That was a wonderful overview. Um, so the next question is for you, Judy. So, you know, one of our big focuses within the working group, and we just heard from Marat that like patients are really driving a lot of this. So like how are the patients thinking about Project Optimus and the inclusion of the patient, patient voice in these decisions? Well, first I'd like to thank Friends of Cancer Research for inviting me and for also being so patient-centered. And that really means a lot to the patient community. So I was actually in, uh, honored to be involved um, as an advocate on Project Optimus, and I was very excited about this. And when I shared the information in the patient community, they were very excited about this paradigm change. Um, patients have been asking for better quality of life during treatment for a very long time. And in, in fact, Ann Lozer, who sadly we lost last month to uh, breast cancer, she was a wonderful advocate, and she actually started the Patient Center Dose Initiative, and she called for dosing to be a collaborative decision by patients and providers, and for optimal dose based on the patient's unique disease or circumstances, taking into account comorbidities and other issues that may affect uh, the drug performance. So in the survivor community, we stress and encourage patients to be their own best advocate and to be honest with their medical team because if they don't report all adverse uh, effects, then there's no way that they, we can evaluate really what the patient experience is like. And this new paradigm with Project Optimus um, promotes the concept that more of a drug does not always need, mean better. And we can achieve patient results without excess toxicity. So this is especially important for patients with metastatic disease because for them, they will probably be on this drug for the rest of their lives or until the drug stops working. And so it's really important that we are able to, to serve them at a dose that they can accommodate, because um, sadly, normally clinical trials are their last hope. Um, so we are embracing Project Optimus, and we thank you for doing that. And um, you know, treatment, we have many more cancer survivors, thank goodness, than before. And so quality of life is really becoming an important challenge. Thank you, Judy. Um, and Ramon, uh, I know we go into this in the white paper, but could you just briefly discuss kind of the, the stages of drug development and when those uh, dose decisions are um, from your industry perspective? Sure, thanks, yeah. Julie. And, and again, thanks to the Friends of Cancer Research for the opportunity to participate in this panel and the discussion around the, the white paper as well. I think many of you are familiar with the overall early development trial system. I'll be brief in the des description. So dose escalation is really where we start dosing in uh, assessing er early drug development trials, followed by dose expansion. Within dose escalation, there's a couple of complications, if you will, in trying to really understand and optimize the dose. 
It's a heterogeneous patient population, typically. These may be patients with different uh, prior treatments. There could be a variety of different tumor types that are included in those early dose escalation studies, uh, and a variety of different comorbidities that the patients initiate with as well. So we'll start the trials in those patients uh, initially, continue to make decisions on dose escalation, largely driven by safety, uh, until we find uh, a dose that could be the maximum tolerated dose for that patient, or if we're if we're lucky, ideally, we'll have other indicators to stop dosing. It could be a plateau of exposure. It could be achieving certain pharmacodynamic endpoints as well. But that's really going to be the first decision uh, in this paradigm of identifying the appropriate dose. After we've identified a dose range, typically as the result of this early uh, dose escalation phase, we'll identify a couple of doses that are important to look at dose expansion. Again, in an ideal scenario, we have some indication of activity of that drug as well that we can assess in the dose expansion phase along with the potential toxicity or tolerability. And so with that, we may have one dose level or there could be two dose levels, et cetera, that we're gonna expand out to understand the relationship between the activity and the safety of that particular drug to identify in a more appropriate dose that we wanna use in later stage development. Very good, thank you. So we're next we're gonna move into some discussions regarding the totality of evidence. And so what are some of the challenges that we have with the existing measurements and the data collections that we currently um, have at our, avail uh, at our use? And how can we potentially use some emerging technologies um, to support data collection? So I'm gonna start with you, Enrique. So what are some of the challenges with pharmacokinetic measurements? And what are ways to overcome them? Um, and how do we ensure that these PK measurements that we're including in our clinical trials are really patient-centric? Thanks, Julie, for the question. And I want to thank also Friends of Cancer Research for giving me the opportunity to work in this amazing uh, task force as well as being here today. So as you mentioned, pharmacokinetics are very important in drug development. And I think they are, uh, there, there is something that has to be done in dose escalation and dose expansion, uh, especially in dose escalation. However, many patients have seen this like a burden because they have to come many times to the hospital just for a simple a blood draw. So um, there is a new concept that has been brought by different investigators uh, from North America about the time toxicity, which is mainly how much the patient stays in the hospital due to uh, protocol related uh, activities, like for example, blood draws. So I think when we try to get a clinical trial, and when we do pharmacokinetics in a clinical trial, we need to make sure that we are trying to do the pharmacokinetics that are really needed, as well as trying to optimize the time of the patient on the, on the, on the, on the, on the hospital. There is also some uh, current uh, trends into trying to get pharmacokinetics with home blood draws. This is something that has been started by some of some early phase clinical trials, but it needs further validation. And I think that's a good way to try to have a full integrity of the pharmacokinetic profile, as well as putting the patient into the center of the study, trying to avoid them uh, unnecessary commutes or unnecessary visits in the hospital. Yeah, very good. You know, I, I love I, the emerging technologies here are really exciting. I think and change the landscape of of clinical trials, not just for oncology, but other therapeutic areas as well. Mm -hmm. um, so my next question for, for you, Ramon, so we have a lot of endpoints available to us for efficacy, and some of them we've known for a long time, but what are some of the emerging technologies that we can talk about um, that we can maybe use in early clinical trials that might read out before or can help us make some determinations with regards to activity um, and, and, and help us make some decisions? Sure, thanks. So as I mentioned earlier, in the dose expansion phase, uh, ideally we will have some indication of activity of the drug. Um, it could be an objective response, which is typically the, the measure that we'll use. Uh, and, I, and initially that would also be in a, let's say, a more defined patient population that allows you to better understand you know, the real efficacy impact of, of the therapy that we're testing. Um, so certainly resist using objective responses would be the gold standard, if you will, in early development, although that's challenging as well. I mean, we want to make sure that our indicators of activity in early development will ultimately translate into the true gold standard, which is overall survival at the end of a phase three study. 
there's correlations that we're trying to make between these early indicators of activity in, in phase one and their prediction of how we're going to look at this at the end of a phase three trial, which has obviously a lot of challenges. Uh, but nevertheless, um, objective response is typically what we'll use. Uh, other emerging therapies such as uh, ctDNA, circulating tumor DNA, um, as well as uh, tumor growth kinetics. Those are things that we're certainly exploring in our early development studies right now. Uh, ctDNA, I think, has a lot of promise. There's certainly you know, research papers that are out there that you guys have probably already seen that certainly are looking at trends of how they potentially could be predictive of eventual response. Uh, we're also looking at that in terms of patients that could better benefit from therapies based on baseline levels of ctDNA uh, as we're treating patients. So that's an emerging technology. You know, I think the question of validation certainly comes up of how, how well can we rely on that as really the, the, the next endpoint. At the end of the day, we're trying to collect as much data as we can, mm. objective response, ctDNA, tumor growth kinetics, pull it all together and try to use the totality of that data set to make decisions. Yeah, and I think the key thing here is we're trying to make decisions with regards to usually doses to further evaluate. We're not using right. these, these exploratory or novel endpoints to, to submit for regulatory approval. Exactly. Um, so there's a little more flexibility in how we can potentially use these endpoints for, for decision-making purposes. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit from the patient perspective, Judy. So how is measuring tolerability in these early phase trials important to patients? Well, measuring toler tolerability is so important because the doctor only sees the patient at a snapshot at the office visit. And they could get up that morning and feel really great and go in and he, they say, oh, you look amazing. And, but last week I couldn't get out of bed for four days because I was so sick. So ongoing reporting, um, in my ideal world, we'd have an app where we could put something in every day so that we don't forget um, because, as you know, chemo makes you forget anyway. <laughs> so, and to have it ongoing through the trial because the more exposure you have to, to a drug, there could be other um, adverse effects that you weren't reporting in the beginning. And important for patients, though, I hear this a lot, where they're afraid to report their adverse events because this is their last hope. This drug is their last hope. And they don't want to be taken off the trial. So they tend to sugarcoat it a little bit. But I think if they had a way of reporting it every day, and that could be summarized, um, that I think would benefit everybody that's going to be using that drug in the future. Yeah, thank you. And Gita, we haven't heard from you yet. So your first question today is, is tagging along very nicely on, on Judy's response. And so we've heard that PROs should be included in early phase clinical trials. So can you talk about some ways that we, um, you know, the field is working to establish more standardized methods for measuring, analyzing, and incorporating these PROs into early clinical trials? Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say as a, a hematologist and as a cancer tolerability researcher, it's so exciting to be part of this panel to have such a patient centric discussion about early phase trials. Um, and so I'm going to back it up a little bit to a definition that friends actually proposed a few years ago of cancer treatment tolerability as the degree to which symptomatic and non-symptomatic adverse events affect the ability or desire of a patient to adhere to the dose or intensity of therapy. So, you know, what we're talking about here to really understand tolerability and not just what the human body can physiologically tolerate, but what the patient as a human being can tolerate, we need direct measurement of the patient perspective and how they feel and function on treatment. And that's patient reported outcomes. There are standard measure, uh, methods for measuring and reporting PROs that are easily applicable to early phase trials and have actually been implemented in this space already. And I know early phase studies are unique because of the smaller sample size, less information that is known or obvious, but this doesn't mean that they don't benefit from the implementation of PROs. PROs have been around for a long time, they're highly reliable, and there's a huge body of evidence to support their use, as well as existing tools and analytic strategies. 
Um, the pro-CTCAE library, the patient reported outcomes version of the CTCAE grading criteria is one example of a measurement tool that enables patient reporting of symptomatic toxicities in early phase studies, the way that uh, Judy just alluded to. It contains 126 items assessing symptoms and a free text item. Investigators can choose which of these questions is most relevant based on symptoms that may be common across cancers, um, as well as symptoms that we may have an early signal about from that particular agent in question. And plus, they can implement this free text item to capture unanticipated toxicities patients may experience. You collect this data, and there are also well-validated methods for analyzing PRO data in concert with clinician-reported toxicities. Um, this includes methods like the baseline adjusted method developed by uh, Dr. Amy Lou Duak and Dr. Ethan Bash that accounts for baseline disease-related symptoms and how to account for those in the context of uh, symptoms caused by the drug, as well as a toolkit of other approaches, such as what do we do when we have missing PRO data um, and uh, uh, other uh, analytic strategies that have been developed by groups like Sisaqual and the NCI Tolerability U01 Consortium. So there's, there's lots of uh, different opportunities and standard approaches. Now, I have to say, and you know, Ramon raised this very important point in one of the discussions we had in the white paper, there are definitely costs involved uh, to implementing a rigorously designed PRO substudy within an early phase. Uh, trial, and it's an additional ask of study sites and personnel and sponsors. But that being said, you know, there are many components of early phase studies that are costly and burdensome, like the pharmacokinetic studies that uh, Enrique talked about, what we do them because they're critical to understanding tolerability, defining not only the safety, but the actual tolerability to the patient of cancer therapeutics. And you really need PROs for that. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and Mira, we're running a little bit over time, but I really wanted to quickly understand a little bit from the FDA's thinking, like how they are viewing inclusion of PROs in early phase studies. Yeah, so we believe yeah. that PRO information collected in early phase clinical trials can be extremely beneficial to both patients and drug makers. Drug makers are able to anticipate some of the toxicities their product may have if approved and look at, those, look at some of those issues with tolerability at different dosages. They can consider that information from PROs as part of the totality of data for dosage selection. In my opinion, some of the situations where PRO information might be particularly valuable is if a product is associated with chronic symptomatic low-grade toxicities. So things like diarrhea or blurry vision, where it's very difficult to capture the full extent and the impact on a patient's life in the context of clinic visits. Um, my colleague Gita mentioned some of the measurements that might be most helpful when using PROs for dosage optimization. One additional point is to consider the frequency, just like other things like pharmacokinetics may be captured more frequently early on and then spaced out. That's also something that can be done with PROs to collect them more frequently, understand the onset and trajectory of symptomatic toxicities, and then space, space out that frequency. I do want to um, add that at the FDA, we don't view PRO information as a replacement for standard safety measures, but rather something that can complement standard safety me measurements and enhance our understanding of a patient's um, experience on taking that drug. Um, and Project Optimus is working closely with our colleagues as part of the FDA Oncology Patient-Focused Drug Development Program to better evaluate how some, PRO, some of this PRO information can inform dosage optimization. Yeah, great. That actually transitions us nicely into some of the questions with regards to decision, decision making that I have. And um, we'll go ahead and continue a little bit with some of the PRO topics and I'll turn to you, Judy. There's been some discussion and during the working group and um, even in past PRO uh, friends uh, discussions about the, the open text box and, <laughs> and how that data can be used. And so what is the value of including that open text box for patients? Well, when patients are on a trial, they are told of the expected um, side effects or toxicities, but there are many unexpected toxicities that, unless there's an open text box, those are going to go undocumented. And if we had the open text box and patients could add in these toxicities, then, then that data could be consolidated later um, with the, the drug information pam pamphlets so that 
if, if a patient is experiencing that, they can look back and say, well, yes, maybe 10% of the patients did have that happen as well. It wasn't expected, but it did happen. And so it can reinforce that they know, okay, I don't have another cancer going on. This is something that really other patients ex um, experienced. So it gives the patient more peace of mind. Very good. And before we move on to some of the other decision uh, data or making decisions on our other data, um, Gita, do you have any other uh, like remaining points on how we can use PRO data for decisions about dose? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's a few important points that need to be made here. You know, first is that the sponsors and investigators need to be thoughtful about how we include PROs and design PRO studies that are scientifically rigorous, high quality, make sure you know, we know what we're asking our patients and why, how we're asking it, the right methods, the right analysis, um, how often, and not go into this blind. Um, I think the second thing is there are a few different approaches for how we can do this. And sort of the, the classic approach has been collect PRO data and then when the study is done, look at it on the back end. But actually, I, I, you know, I challenge that paradigm to say a more effective approach in early phase trials is um, to collect the PRO data and share it in real time with the physician. And this kind of um, shared decision making is where we really may actually be able to incorporate the patient perspective at the point of care into dose optimization in a meaningful way. And you've, you know, we're talking about dynamic early phase studies here where you have cohorts and you have decisions that need to be made in clinic. You need to inform the clinical investigators like me how the patients are feeling at that moment in time um, to really have a chance uh, to influence how I'm gonna grade that toxicity and have that influence how the dose will be optimized. This has been done, we talk about it in the white paper in a few different examples. The Alliance N1048, which was a pro uh, plenary paper at ASCO is one example. Uh, another example was at a, a phase two lung study at Memorial Sloan Kettering, where patients were asked to fill out surveys in the waiting room about their symptoms. And that was populated into the same electronic system that investigators used to assign their CTCAE grading. So they could see the patient information in real time. And you know, I, I wanna make the point and emphasize what Marat said, the PRO data are not meant to replace the clinician's assessment. They just enhance them. And I think that's a very important point um, to, to emphasize. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so Enrique, we're gonna turn to you uh, the, about some specific considerations for making decisions, not only um, during dose escalation, but dose expansion. So like how, what are, what are some things that you usually think about as an investigator when determining? Because I feel like the data there is, it depends really on where you are in dose escalation and how, we've, um, how many patients we have to, to inform um, to those decisions. So what are some considerations? Yes, thank you. So as Ramon has mentioned before, uh, there is two main phases in clinical, in early cl phase clinical trials, the drug escalation and dose suspension. And I think in every of these different areas, there is a time point in which you have to do decisions to go for a next dose level or to do the recommended phase dose, phase two dose. So basically on the dose escalation, I think it's important to know that we make the decisions with just a small number of patients at a limited time, what we call the dose limiting toxicity period time, which is usually three to four weeks depending on the, on the study drug. And at that moment, the only available data that we have as, as investigators to make decisions is mainly safety, the main adverse events. Sometimes we have also the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic, pharmacodynamics data, but that's not very common. So we have to make a decisions about going a higher dose, lower dose, or maintain the same dose based mainly on adverse events. Once we complete all the dose escalation and we have tested in different dose levels the drug, we have much more information to make decisions. And then we can have the full pharmacokinetics, the full pharmacodynamics, and also we can send some preliminary activity or efficacy data. In that moment, probably the PROs that, uh, uh, Mirat, uh, that uh, sorry, Gita was mentioned before could be useful to try to choose which are going to be the doses to go into the dose expansion. Usually in the dose expansion, we have a couple of doses, the ones that seems to be safer and at the same time uh, uh, have some preliminary efficacy. We have some discussions in the working group whether we should randomize or not into two different doses. Uh, we didn't have an agreement on that, but it's something that probably in the future we should consider doing that in, in early phase clinical trials. 
And when we finish the dose expansion and we got at the end of the dose expansion, we have to make the decision about what is going to be the dose that is going to be taken for registration of the studies. And at that moment, we have all the information, not only the information from the dose expansion, but also the information from the dose escalation at that specific cross level, and putting together all the information, PK, PD, tolerability, adverse events, as well as some of the new technology that we are running right now, we can make a decision to go further. Very good. Well, that was a wonderful overview. Um, Ramon, with regards to treatment modalities, um, how does that influence the decisions with regards to dose? So treatment moda modalities, we might think about uh, therapeutic indices that can influence the types of data that we might make a decision on. Uh, for example, with uh, antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, we often see generally less toxicity. Uh, and so your decision around dose and dose optimization may not be based on an MTD, right? It might be instead based on receptor occupancy or other or PK, PK plateaus or other endpoints that uh, limit your dose escalation. Uh, for other modalities, perhaps in some of the small molecules or even some of the targeted therapies, uh, we might see more narrow therapeutic indices where you would expect to see actually more untarget toxicity. And that might actually drive uh, more of the, the dose optimization endpoints, uh, drive for other um, um, endpoints that you want to assess for, bring up more conversations around PROs or other uh, evidence for understanding the patient's toxicity or tolerability. So it really depends on, I think, the modality uh, that may influence what you're going to actually see uh, in terms of uh, tolerability or your stopping criteria for dose escalation. Yeah, no, absolutely. And last but not least, Marat, from the FDA's perspective, the, you know, what do they consider um, or how are you guys considering the totality of evidence with regards to these decisions? Yeah, sure, I think yeah. this is a really important question to discuss. <laughs> Um, so I think when we're saying to look at the totality of evidence, and this is for all stakeholders, not just FDA, what we're really saying is consider a lot of the elements we've discussed today, along with dose and exposure response relationships, and really try and understand what are the benefit risk trade-offs between the different dosages that have been evaluated, and use that assessment to make the best decision about the dosage to carry forward. Um, when we in FDA are looking at the dosage for registrational trial or the dosage at time of approval and deciding is this dosage supported, what we're really doing is looking at these benefit risk trade-offs. We're also looking at what are some of the lingering questions and of course we're interpreting all of this within the therapeutic context for which the product is being developed. Um, I do want to take a moment and point people towards a newer resource available through FDA Oncology which is the Oncology Drug Dosing Toolkit. Um, this is something that's been posted online as its own web page, and it's really meant to aid decision makers or drug makers and other stakeholders regarding their decision making around dosage optimization, and particularly what are some of the key elements in the totality of data, what are some of the, what are some of the key questions to answer in those key areas. Um, I do want to just take one moment and address some of the comments about randomization, which we had a lot of discussion in the working group, and I think FDA's recommendation for randomization as part of dosage optimization has become a bit of a hot button issue. Um, I just want to explain why this is our strong recommendation. It's not something that's meant to be a checkbox, but it's something that we believe is an incredibly important tool to help us understand dose and exposure response relationships for dosage optimization. It's the most powerful tool we have to limit the influence of confounders when we're trying to interpret these relationships. Yeah, no, thank you for, for getting that, that R word into the discussion as well. It's almost turned into a bad word um, here in the development space for oncology. It's, it's very decisive. Um, so before I uh, start to work through our conclusions here, I just wanted to remind people that we will spend the last 15 minutes with questions from both the audience here in person in Washington, D.C. and virtually. Um, if you are a virtual participant, you can submit question and answers uh, via Zoom. Um, so as we kind of wrap up the, this, this panel discussion, I wanted to talk a little bit about future directions. Um, and we'll start with you, Judy. Um, how do you see this space evolving to better meet the desires of more optimized doses and more tolerable treatments? Uh, and what are considerations that uh, we should think about when performing these trials for patients? Well, I think that patients are going to need to have some education 
because especially the patients that start out with the MTD, the maximum tolerated dose, and then cannot function, educate them that it's okay to dial it back to the optimum tolerated dose. And um, when I was diagnosed with bilateral breast cancer 15 years ago, the paradigm then was chemotherapy no matter what. Um, however, my oncologist um, at Dana-Farber, there was a new test at the time called the Oncotypes test. And so I was benefited by it because my Oncotypes score came back so low that I didn't need chemo. But I always tell patients, you don't know what you don't know. And so I went in to her office and I said, but isn't it better if I have chemo? Because, you know, when you're a cancer patient, it's not only a physical um, experience, it's a psychological experience. And you're willing to do anything and bargain with God to be around for a while. And so I just thought, well, isn't more better? And she said, no, because if we use a chemo on you now, and if your cancer were to recur, that's one less thing we have to treat you. And, um, and that made like perfect sense to me. And um, I, I just think that we need to encourage patients that you don't have to suffer um, with the side effects. You know, be honest with your providers and work as a team. And, it's very exciting now that we're working towards uh, a patient-centered yes. treatment plan. Yes, absolutely. So, thank you. Uh, Enrique, I'll move to you next on some of your thoughts for future considerations. So, uh, as I mentioned before, I think we need to take into account not just the adverse events in the overall perspective of the dose optimization. We have to take into account all the data that is generated in the clinical trial that it's not only the DLT period, it goes beyond the DLT period. We also need to take pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. I think tolerability is also something that I think, as we hear here, is very important to take together, as well as the new technologies that we are using in clinical trials. And I think probably artificial intelligence could help on that sense to try to put together all the information and then create a kind of algorithm to try to optimize and to try to choose at the best dose to go for the next studies. And I think the most important part, and this is something that I think we can see here in this meeting, is that when we, when we take into, when we want to do an early phase clinical trial, we have to get the voice, not only from the industry and the clinicians, but also from the regulatory agencies, and obviously because of from the patients, because we want to make sure that the trials that we are performing are scientifically sound, but at the same time are patient-centered. Very good. Yeah, thank you, Enrique. Uh, so, Giga, you're next. So, what are some of your future considerations? Yeah, I mean, I think when we reflect about early phase trials, you know, they've historically focused squarely on safety, but it is expanding to understand, you know, the, the discussions now that you hear today are really focused on understanding tolerability in a very multifaceted way, including through the incorporation of patient reported outcomes. Um, which will hopefully lead to less of this concept that Judy described, patients kind of suffering through it um, and not only tolerating but thriving. Uh, methods exist today to uh, implement and analyze PROs to inform tolerability and I'm really hopeful that we'll see more high quality PRO studies and early phase trials where we provide patient reported data to clinicians in real time this requires effort, it requires innovation, but it will help to achieve this true dose optimization and a comprehensive understanding of treatment tolerability. Very good. Uh, and Ramon, what are some of your future considerations? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I, I think certainly there's been an emphasis um, from industry in bringing forward safer therapies best we can. Uh, trying to minimize or limit the use of chemotherapy certainly is a part of our, our regular discussions. And so we certainly recognize that although they had their place in history, you know, it's ideal that we can move towards more targeted therapies that are safer for patients as well. Uh, we're collecting more data today than we ever have before. We've talked about it in a variety of different um, you know, new technologies, CTDNA, et cetera, that will give us more data 
And we're also in an era where we can probably analyze data a lot better than we did mm -hmm. before with AIML and some of these other techniques that I know are starting to integrate uh, into these kind of decisions around dose and dose optimization. So I'm very hopeful that you know, as we progress and we're able to harness more and more of these data on our patients and our trials, they can even dial in even better the doses that we want to take into later stage development. So I think we've got the data, we've got the technology, we've got certainly the mindset that we can use all of these different components to better optimize our doses, and I think we certainly will. I think it'll be a win for ourselves. It certainly allows us to have better success in later stage trials. So it's a win-win for all of us, and I, I think we're moving in that direction. Very good, thank you. And last but not least, Marat, why don't you give your future considerations? Sure. Yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, so I think it's important to keep in mind that we are trying to change the way something's been done for many decades. And so, of course, it's expected that there would be challenges. And I think having conversations like this is incredibly important to be able to discuss some of those challenges. I think if we keep the goal in mind, which is to approve a drug at a dosage that's been optimized for benefit risk, a lot of the concepts we've been talking about kind of follow naturally from there. Um, and ending on a, a very optimistic note, I want to mention that over the past year, we are seeing many, many more development programs paying attention to drug dosing very early in development. And so I think over the next few years, we really will be getting to a place where many oncology drugs have dosages optimized at the time of approval. Yeah, no, thank you. You know, I, I totally agree. I think that with adversity, which is kind of where we all are, right, we've, we've kind of been dropped some of these new expectations. It's shifted our mindset of how we have to think about things that we've historically done in a relatively routine manner. I think it also comes with the creativity, and I'm really excited to see actually what the field is going to do and how we can progress a lot of these, um, a lot of these tools and data analyses. Um, so it looks like we have a uh, first question. I see, I don't see anyone at the microphones here internally, so I'll go to the web. Um, so we have uh, Katie Thornton who is asking, uh, while Project Optimus is focused on enhancing dose optimization in the pre-market, how does FDA envision continuing to use flexibility in evaluating the role of post-marketing studies to continue dose optimization when appropriate? So I think this obviously goes to you, Marat. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so thanks for the question. Um, so the goal of Project Optimus is for the dosage to be optimized prior to drug approval, and it's because we think that this is what is best for patients and oncology drug development overall. It's very hard and sometimes can have challenges with feasibility to do a dosage optimization trial in the post-marketing setting, and patients might be exposed to toxicities that could have been avoided if the dosage had been optimized prior to approval. Um, I do want to mention that we, of course, understand that Project Optimus kind of started at one point in time, and there were products that were in a more advanced state of development, kind of when Project Optimus was being implemented. Additionally, there might be programs that attempt dosage optimization prior to drug approval, but there are lingering questions that need to be addressed in the post-marketing setting. In both of those situations, we could envision that there might be a post-marketing requirement for further dosage optimization, but that's not really the goal. Our goal is for the dosage to be optimized at time of drug approval. Yeah, no, very good. And um, I tell my clients quite a bit that regulatory lag is real and that you can't use current press, current approvals sometimes as good precedents. The, um, the drugs that are in the IND stage that are usually the ones that are confidential are the ones that should be setting precedent. So um, thank you for mentioning that. I'll go to this microphone for first question. Hi, Mark Stewart, Friends of Cancer Research. Mm -hmm. One question is we're working together to generate this data and higher quality evidence. Do we also need to think about new mechanisms of getting this information to the patients and physicians? Obviously, the drug label is one source, but we may find ourselves in a situation where the labeled you know, dosage, while it may be appropriate for a, a general swath of the population, there may be instances where it is appropriate for a different dose. And if we have data to support those, how do we get that out to help inform those decisions? Um, yeah, and I don't know if anyone else here on the panel would like to talk a little bit about that. I mean, I think that um, 
reading the FDA reviews is usually a really great place to start to look at uh, alternative populations. You know, not everything makes it to the label, but there can be a wealth of information from there that sometimes doesn't show up in even publications um, from the, the phase three trials because some of these data come from, from other clinical trials that were included in the dossiers. But I'm wondering, um, Ramon, if you would like to comment anything on this one? Uh, well, certainly when we, when we generate our data, um, we have data that goes into the label. We have uh, data, data that's also going to be published uh, that our medical affairs teams will um, make sure is available through different symposia or, like I said, publications, et cetera. That's probably the best mechanism we have just to let people know uh, the, the details of our data sets for maybe other populations that were studied um, in, in that way. Very good. And I can't see you, but I see somebody there. So you can go. <laughs> yeah, go somebody ahead. is uh, Dr. Fred Hirsch. I'm a medical oncologist from uh, Mount Sinai in New York. And uh, my comment is uh, we talked earlier about uh, a low representation in clinical trials in general. Uh, it's not only about what kind of uh, participation we have in clinical trials, but also, how, how does the panel see a, a majority of our patients are in poor performance status and never come into clinical trials? Another, uh, another uh, perspective is uh, minorities, disparities. Uh, we know that is an issue in clinical trials, and that even might affect tolerability, uh, feasibility, et cetera, et cetera. So poor performance status, diversity, mm. how do we deal with that in early clinical trials? And how do we see it in the future? Yeah, so Enrique, would you like to talk about this? Yes, so that's a great point, and I think that's one of the main keys about not only drug development, but also in phase two, phase three studies, right? How we can make sure that all the ethnicities and all the minorities are represented in clinical trials. I know that the NCI is working hard on that. There is, uh, there is a lot of work in equality, diversity, and integrity uh, in, in, in studies. And I think this is something that, that uh, clinicians and industry are quite aware that has to be increased in clinical trials and they have to be representative. Regarding the performance status, I understand that point also. The problem with the performance status is that these drugs are new drugs. They are drugs who are in development, so we don't know what is going to be the side effects or the toxicity. Therefore, in that, in that, in that situation, patients with a performance status which is not the greatest one, I think at least in the dose escalation, until we have a clear guidance of what is the toxicity profile, I think they should be excluded. But Hopefully in those expansion, and obviously in phase two and phase three studies, I think we should try to, to take patients with a worse performance status into trials. Because as you mentioned, these are patients that are, could also benefit from the study drug, and this could be more global interpreted. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I think this is really an important question to be addressing within the context of dosage optimization. So we at FDA feel strongly that the patients that are enrolled in the early phase clinical trials, especially the trials that are supporting the dosage that will become the approved dosage or dosages, um, should represent those patients who would be eligible for that drug in clinical practice. And that includes with respect to things like age and ECOG performance status, with your men which you're mentioning. FDA has advocated for broadened eligibility criteria really for a long time in terms of certain comorbid medical conditions that patients with cancer might have. Um, not having age cutoffs unless there's a scientific basis for them, broadening, you know, broadening eligibility criteria really to improve the representativeness of the patients enrolled into those clinical trials. Um, and that's incredibly important for dosage optimization too because um, we, you know, if there are differences in pharmacokinetics or pharmacogenomics and factors like those and tolerability like you mentioned, we really want to understand those things in the pre-market space and not find those things out in the clinic post-approval. So really appreciate the question. Thank you so Very much. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll go over to this mic. Very good panel. I'm Michael Saugaller. I'm with the National Cancer Institute. I have a question for Judith and, and those of you who enroll patients and just wondering, you know, as a newly diagnosed patient, admittedly, you, you, you can't know what you're going to experience to you experience 
it. But that stated, do you think that the consent form and the initial discussions with your clinician, what, could, is there ways that it could be improved to prepare the patient, so to speak, for what they are able to experience to potentially uh, reduce the, you know, the patients leaving the study and, and things like that? Yeah, so I think w the patient consent form, uh, there's a lot of discussion about that in the patient community because we feel it's not sometimes detailed enough to, and, and then there's a further challenge where when we want diversity, um, attract diversity in the patient population, um, it's normally only in English and, um, you know, I'm involved with the breast cancer vaccine clinical trial, and uh, we're looking for Latino um, and women of color for the trial, but the uh, consent form's in English. And so um, what we've discussed in the ideal world would be that you would have a patient advocate that would speak the language of the patient um, and explain to the patient in their own language, you know, what the trial is about and, and about participation because we have found in our trial it's been a little difficult. Um, it's a geographical problem too because we're one center, but we found it difficult to attract um, Latino and women of color because they just don't understand, you know, everything's in English and it's sadly not. I think that's a really great question, and I just want to add to it as well, your point about, you know, how do we explain to patients so we don't, you know, get them dropping out of the study. But I think, you know, to, to add on to your point, Judy, it's also explaining, what, you know, the justification for what we're asking people on these studies, right. you know. We're trying to understand how the drug affects the body, how the body affects the drug, and how you feel and function. And that's why we need to ask these questions this often, and this is how the data will be used. And I completely agree with you, Judy. Um, I have to give uh, a lot of credit to our colleagues in the FDA Oncology Center for Excellence. Uh, they've partnered with us at Mayo Clinic on a trial that we're doing to study physical function in patients on treatment for cancer. And that trial required multimodal data, Fitbit data, patient reported outcomes, kind of required a, a bit of interaction from patients. And um, we involved a panel of patient advocate research partners to develop, in addition to the boilerplate consent, which, you know, let's face it, that's a legal document that's got to be in place. But we had a one pager that was written by the patient advocates that said, this is the purpose of this study. This is what you're going to be asked to do. It's a bit of a lift to do that. But I think not only does it help your, um, your retention in the study, but it really elucidates. I mean, generally, the sense I've gotten from patient advocates and patients is they're very happy to participate in research, even if they know it may not help their mm -hmm. situation directly. But let's justify and explain to people why they're doing that. That will help with the retention and the understanding overall. And I think the best way to do that is to partner with, with patients and patient mm -hmm. advocates. Absolutely. Um, we'll go to this mic. Hi, I'm Sue Anna Brinigi with the American Society of Clinical Oncology. That was actually a fantastic segue to my question, so mm -hmm. thank you for that, uh, panelists. But this has been a great discussion, and it's great to see um, FDA encouraging this uh, approach in earlier phase um, drug development. We're actually launching a study next year on CDK4-6 inhibitors and different dosing patterns and doing it in a post-marketing um, setting, which is really hard. But we're thinking a little bit about, and Judy, I'm glad you mentioned Ann Lozier because she was involved mm -hmm. um, before her, her death. And um, one of the things that we're thinking about using PROs is, um, and the, you know, the, the burden that that places on patient participants, um, how do we provide compensation for that? I think this is a, you know, it's a, a bit of a dicey topic, um, depending on who your IRB is and how you talk about these things, but we really do want to recognize the time and effort that patients put into this, and really glad, Enrique, that you mentioned the idea of time toxicity, too, because that's a very real thing. So um, I'm just curious, I'd like your thoughts on compensation um, and, you know, if we can recognize the valuable data that, that par trial participants are providing. Yeah. Does anyone want to take that quickly? 
Judy, do you want to tackle that one, or do you want me to provide some? I'll, I'll play well, off to you. Well, I'll give you an example. So um, in our trial, we don't have any money allocated for that. It's, it's a federal grant. And we actually had a big discussion in one of our meetings, even for <coughs> to get more diversity, could we pay for transportation costs? And it's a complicated thing with the IRB because you can't offer something to one patient without the other. And uh, I just don't know if PROs would be something they'd pay money for because it seems like if you agree to be in the trial, I would think there would be the requirement that you complete that since it's such an important part um, of the results. Yeah, it's a, it, you know, it's a really good question, and I struggle mm -hmm. with this a lot as a PRO researcher because I want to be very respectful of people's time. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the stuff that Enrique is doing, the PK and pharmacodynamic studies are also very time consuming. Um, in one of our trials, we did sort of look at the PRO questionnaires we were asking. We guesstimated how much time it would take to complete them, and we elected to sort of dispense, you know, visa mm -hmm. gift cards uh, to that amount. Surprisingly, the patient advocates who were part of our research panel were not very moved by this idea. I still was extraordinarily stubborn, and I said, everybody would love to get money. I'm still going to put it in. <laughs> but the patients on my actual trial were like, yeah, this is not a great motivator. It's a far greater motivator to us to be contributing to the science. And, mm. you know, the, the things they did tell me, which are, you know, hard, harder to accomplish than you would think at some centers is, Yes, if there, there could be a free parking voucher or if, you know, you've got to stay overnight. Uh, you know, some study sponsors are really good about saying, you know, we're going to compensate the two nights of hotels, knowing the intensity of. Um, but, it, you know, it, it doesn't seem you would have to survey a larger population of patients. But a lot of the ones that have partnered with me on research that I do, um, I've, I've learned surprising things, uh, as Judy alluded to, as to, you know, what's meaningful to patient participants. and you know, the, the level of altruism and the time commitment that goes in uh, mm -hmm. for our patients with cancer participating on research, which I think is something all of us on the panel want to acknowledge and, and appreciate. Very good. Well, I think that's a wonderful uh, topical timely end to, to, to be talking about patients and tolerability and PROs as our last question. So we're going to wrap it up here. Um, before I do that, I just want to thank friends for, first of all, bringing this topic uh, to, uh, to the conversation uh, for this year's annual meeting, uh, for the working group members that worked tirelessly on our white paper, and as well as the panelists that joined me here today. So thank you. Thank you all uh, very much for such a thoughtful discussion. I know our panelists will be around if there's additional questions um, that uh, I'm sure they would be happy to discuss with you during the break, which we will move to now. Um, please, uh, let's, let's break until 11.45. Um, <clears throat> I think that's about 10 minutes, um, but we will start promptly at 11.45 given the large online audience that we would like to accommodate.
If everyone could please find their seats, we'll be getting the program in one minute. Thank you. Okay, if everyone could go ahead and grab their seats, we'll, uh, we'll get started with our next session here. All right, thank you. Uh, well, as people are drifting in and uh, grabbing their seats back, I'll uh, invite our next panel to uh, come up and take their seats. Um, this session will be focused on uh, pragmatic designs and data elements. Um, we are looking forward to the discussion. I think, um, as was alluded to earlier this morning, uh, there's a very nice case study that is up and running um, in partnership through the uh, Pragmatica program at the FDA OCE, the Pragmatic Lung Trial. I think we'll hear a fair amount about that experience during this discussion today. Uh, but also we'll be focusing on other situations, data elements, and scenarios that may be conducive to a more pragmatic or reduced data collection or, or optimized data collection type of approach. So we're looking forward to our panel's insights. Thank you uh, to all of you for your contributions uh, over the last couple of weeks um, in developing the, the white paper that can be linked to today. So I will turn things over now to our moderator, Naksika Karunadum. Um, from Huffman LaRoche uh, to lead the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff, and hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session on pragmatic trials, an incredibly important topic in terms of how we, we will most likely need to be doing trials in the future. Um, my name is Napsika Kronidu. I am a regulatory strategy lead at uh, Hoffman La Roche based in Basel, and I'm here with a wonderful uh, team of panelists. We're, we're going to explore the concept of pragmatic trials, share with you some of the insights that we um, generated through the various discussions, and also some of the information which is uh, within the, um, the paper. Um, I would now like to introduce the panelists. On my left, um, I have Erin Larkins. Uh, she is a thoracic head and neck cancer oncologist and uh, supervisory associate director for the division of oncology two at the FDA. Next, I have, we have Boris Kin Lin, who is also an oncologist and a lead researcher on several oncology trials, and he's an associate vice president at Eli Lilly. Next, we have Sumitra Mandrikar. She's a professor of biostatistics and oncology at the Mayo Clinic, and she is also a clinical, clinical and um, uh, 
Data Management Center for the Alliance of Clinical Trials in Oncology. Next, we have Kristin McJunkins. She is a patient advocate. And finally, we have Margaret Mooney, who is an associate director of the Cancer Therapy Evaluation Program, so-called CTEP, and chief of the Clinical Investigations Branch, CIP, of the National Cancer Institute. So welcome to the panel. Um, I'd like to remind the audience that uh, following the panel discussion, there will be a 15-minute Q&A. So please uh, continue submitting your questions through the Q&A function of Zoom for those people who are online. And of course, there will be uh, the opportunity for people in the room to ask their questions as well. Um, we would like to start the conversation with the value of pragmatic clinical trials from different angles. And Erin, I would like to uh, start by asking you, what made the FDA start Project Pragmatica? Thanks, and I just wanted to say thank you for uh, inviting me to be on the white paper and the panel to friends. It was a great experience. So there was a small trial, randomized trial, in lung cancer comparing a combination of two therapies that are approved in other spaces for lung cancer, ramucirumab and pembrolizumab, that showed an overall survival benefit. Very small study, not enough data to support a regulatory approval. And that was sort of the spark for Pragmatica. So looking at this data, you know, FDA said, what's the question we actually want to answer? Is this real? Is there a survival advantage to using this combination? How much other information do we need to be comfortable approving this drug if there's a survival benefit? We know the safety profile of both drugs. Can there be a study with very limited safety data collection? Do we really need to know what progression-free survival is, if there's a clear overall survival advantage. So this was sort of the spark to start it. And uh, we did a lot of work with NCI, and the trial is up and running and off the ground. 12-page protocol, five-page consent. You pretty much never see that in a large phase three cancer clinical trial. Um, and a lot of the work was having a protocol come to us and say, we don't think you need that. Um, so Pragmatica Lung is sort of the far end of the spectrum. It's about as pared down as you can get a study, and a large part of that has to do with the amount of data we have. But we don't want Pragmatica to be a one-off or only used in this space. The key is to look at pragmatic design elements, and every trial can be looked at to see if you can incorporate pragmatic design elements. This was just talked about in the other panel. Even in early phase trials, eligibility criteria is a pragmatic element that we've been pushing at the FDA for many, many years to try to expand to include people with ECOG PS of two in some of these studies so that it's more reflective of the real world. So any trial can be looked at um, to see are there pragmatic elements that can be incorporated into this. Also, you know, while this came out of a desire for a potential regulatory approval to bring a therapy to patients, there are plenty of other spaces outside of the regulatory space where pragmatic trial designs would be hugely useful. We have a large number of studies reading out right now in the neoadjuvant adjuvant space in lung cancer, and as a clinician who still sees patients, it's a mess. I don't know what to use with my patients. You know, it's gonna be a discussion with each individual patient. A pragmatic trial in that sort of space to help inform practice of medicine would be hugely relevant. But that's something we need buy-in, you know, that's more likely to come out of cooperative groups, but we would also need buy-in from the pharma companies to help support studies like that because they would need to be very large. That's the other issue with pragmatic trials. Because you're expanding eligibility, um, you need to size up the trials oftentimes. The effect size may not be the same if you're enrolling a patient population that's not as healthy as the one that would be enrolled to a classic clinical trial. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, you've outlined also a lot of the, some of the challenges, uh, the potential challenge, opportunities and challenges. Um, I would now like to switch to another topic, and that is relates to the definition of pragmatic trials. Uh, most of us know that the concept is not new. Uh, in fact, the first publication of pragmatic trials dates back to the mid-60s. Uh, yet, we also know that very few of those pragmatic trials have generated evidence for regulatory decision. There's also a lot of ongoing activities right now in pragmatic trials, which is very encouraging from different institutions. 
but that has also um, created some sort of a confusion in terms of what do we actually mean about pragmatic trials. Um, the concept, oh, it's, uh, these are ty the type of trials which generate effectiveness data. Oh, these are randomized pragmatic trials which can generate high quality real world evidence. And there's nothing wrong with all those definitions, but there is, um, there is also um, something we, we had to address as a pan when we were thinking about the, the white paper. How do we define pragmatic trials and how did we choose to, what did we choose to focus on for this paper? So Boris, would you mind uh, helping us out a little bit here? So I, I think I'm speaking for the group here um, about, this took several sessions <laughs> to actually discuss and I, I actually honestly don't think we actually came to a true consensus about that because I think, you know, w how you define a pragmatic trial is in some ways uh, dependent upon what the answer is you want and what level of knowledge you already have about the compounds and so um, I think we started then to kind of look first at the, uh, the FDA definition of a pragmatic trial which is a looking at a clinical trial that is um, comparing a, a, a intervention versus a comparator um, in a randomized setting uh, and uh, uh, looking into primarily the, the patient population that is a, uh, considered you know, part of routine st uh, clinical practice, right? So that includes maybe a patient population that's a little bit more heterogeneous than the patient population that's shown in our standard clinical trial and all that. I think as we are talking about, you know, the, the uh, idea of uh, a pragmatic trial, it, it became obvious that it's not just the population that we're talking about in terms of uh, increasing uh, enrollment in that uh, groups that look maybe can increase generalizability of your m molecule, but also taking into consideration all these sort of uh, burden to the site as well as uh, some of the issues that uh, would, uh, you know, m not necessarily be part of routine standard of care, right, or routine clinical practice. So I think we, we started focusing on what are the particular elements of a clinical trial that we could make pragmatic and then determining how we can make those, you know, those elements put into a clinical trial, uh, whether it be a very pragmatic clinical trial with, uh, as a base, as Aaron was saying, uh, pragmatic lung to anything uh, like uh, that we could put into even registration trials that uh, pharmaceutical industries are, are doing as well. So we looked at a couple, several different aspects of that. That includes this trial design overall. What are the important endpoints that we're going to be looking at? I'm going to repeat a lot of the things that Aaron just said right now, right? Um, so the eligibility criteria, uh, the flexibility in dosing and how we can do that flexibility and in, uh, in, in uh, dose reductions. Uh, what kind of data should we be collecting? Should we be collecting uh, um, more safety data? Could we limit the amount of safety data? Could we limit the, t the, the assessments that we do for these patients? Also that we can provide uh, data that is um, within sort of the standard routine clinical practice and all that. So, um, so I think those are the elements that we we're kind of looking at. And I think, as I was saying before, uh, a lot of this is in the context of what we already know about the molecule. So if we know a lot more about the molecule, we can be pragmatic and say maybe there's certain elements that we don't have to capture as well. Um, as well as just what the question is where you want to answer. So if it's for, for registrational studies, we might need more rigor. We might need more things that might make the trial less pragmatic for a certain site. And if we want something that influences clinical practice, maybe we don't need a, that, as much data. So I think those are some of the elements that we, we looked at. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Boris. Yeah, that's for a very clear um, description of the different pragmatic elements uh, that we talked about. And um, in fact, we also used, um, we used the, a specific tool, uh, the PRECIS2 uh, tool, which helped us also define a little bit more in a more structured where, way those pragmatic dimensions. And as Boris said, there is of course a different, um, within a pragmatic domain, there is a spectrum of pragmatism as well. So it's for, and for each scientific question, um, it, it will be important to assess the degree of pragmatism within that spectrum that we would need to, to use. Um, I would now like to switch gears a little bit and, and talk about, start talking about um, how should we um, 
So, so let me take a step back. We, the traditional clinic, randomized clinical trials have actually served us very well for, for generating uh, evidence uh, in certain situations. Um, the question I have is why should we actually be considering pragmatic elements? And, um, and I'd like to start with you, Kirsten. What, from a patient perspective, why do you think, what benefit could pragmatic trials bring for the patient? Mm, thank you, and thank you for friends. This has been a very interesting discussion, and I love how all of the panels really build on each other and, and interconnect. So from the pragmatic trial perspective, patients, I feel, really think that it could reduce the burden of trial participation and give the opportunity for more patients to participate in clinical research. As we heard earlier this morning, there's only about 5% of cancer patients that are participating in clinical trials. And by having more targeted and reduced data collection, it could really mean potentially less visits and procedures that are more aligned with routine clinical practice and in some cases, patients might potentially be able to receive their treatment at their regular point of care. The trials could also, as we've heard many times already, have um, increased diversity in the patient populations involved through race, ethnicity, age, gender, and even comorbidities. In some cases, pragmatic trials are more likely to use endpoints that are measured in routine clinical practice and have be more meaningful to patients. And by broadening this eligibility criteria, it really provides the opportunity to assess efficacy as well as the safety of therapeutics in additional patient populations that aren't often having the opportunity to be included in clinical trials. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Sumitra, any additional thoughts from your perspective in terms of why should we, from a site perspective, or why should we be doing pragmatic trials from that angle? Um, thank you for the question, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. I share everybody's enthusiasm about this working group and how nicely we discussed a lot of the aspects. So what I will say, I mean, we heard a lot from Dr. Bertinoli and Dr. Caleb earlier this morning about how trials have become increasingly complicated. Um, and it, it could be the infrastructure of these trials, it could be the data collection on the trials, it could be the type of questions we are asking on the trials. But at the end of the day, what happens is when you have such complicated uh, trials, it reduces, I think Kristen noted, you know, site participation because sites have workflows that they have to put in place to be able to uh, mount these clinical trials and provide the data. So it definitely reduces site excitement and enthusiasm for, uh, for trials. It also impacts uh, patient participation on the trials. So not only do we uh, are unable to accrue to some of these trials because we open these trials and then we wonder why there is, you know, the accrual to the trials are lagging, but it also impacts ability for us to retain patients on the study. Uh, because of the complicated uh, visits, the data collection, the schedules that don't probably always align with uh, care visits, right? Research visits and care visits probably don't align very well and, and that causes a tremendous burden on the whole um, infrastructure at the sites and, and uh, for the patients who participate in the trials. Um, so if we can streamline clinical trials, if we can simplify the questions and we can simplify the data collection um, on the clinical trials, I think that will serve us very well um, to the, all the points that was raised earlier that uh, it, it will broaden patient participation, we will get diverse patient participation, we will have community engagement, community sites able to participate and thus you broaden the diverse enrollment uh, to the clinical trials. Thank you, Sumitra. That's in, indeed a very broad spectrum of uh, advantages, some of which are actually also re relevant for the industry. But Boris, would, are there any additional considerations that you would like to bring yeah. from an industry perspective? I mean, I think obviously that's a very bo big part of it all to increase the, uh, uh, the enrollment. I, overall, it, it comes down to how quickly you can finish a trial once you start it, right? <laughs> Um, that is based on first enrollment, right? And then the uh, part of it is the execution and how quickly you can like review the data. 
So I, I think if we brought in enrollment, obviously you have better chance of enrolling your trial quicker. I think the streamlining is a very important part of this discussion as well, because if you streamline data, that's less data that you have to query afterwards, that's less data that you have to look at, easier for in sites to input it all, and so you should be able to clean your data quickly and get uh, analysis done faster. So it's both a front end and a back end uh, um, efficiency. Absolutely, and I think that's something, a, 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 a very important topic. Unfortunately, our oncology clinical trials, we all know, have become incredibly complex, and so that simplification has advantages, carries advantages from all, I would say, advocate for all stakeholders. Now, we've talked a lot about the advantages of pragmatic trials, but there are probably going to be some barriers as well. So, Meg, would you like to outline some of the barriers in... Uh, conducting such, such tri trials. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you for that question, and thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel today. Um, I, I actually don't think there are as many structural barriers as we think there are, <laughs> and part of it is just a mindset. When I started in oncology 20, 30 years ago, we had such things that we called large, simple trials, mm -hmm. and somehow, as we learned more about the biology of cancer and um, the ability for certain um, targeted therapies to um, be beneficial in subsets of patients. Um, and we also wanted to learn as much as we could every time we mounted a trial, that our trials actually got more and more complex, added more burdens on data collection. I think we lost sight of asking the question, what do we really need to understand? What's essential? What are we asking sites and patients to do if we want to make these uh, trials accessible across the United States and in communities? What do we have to do to make sure we engage everyone and we reduce that burden? So I think when the opportunity came along um, to look at something like uh, Pragmatica Lung, which was a registrational intent trial for a secondary indication of the combination in lung cancer, they asked us at the NCI, would be, we be interested in such a large, simple trial? And of course, our answer was, well, why wouldn't we? <laughs> because everybody knew a lot about the um, individual side effects of the agents because of prior trials. We also had a small randomized phase trial that had been conducted um, within Lung Map, which, uh, of which NCI is one of the partners in that public-private partnership. And so we even knew a, a, a good bit about the side effects of the combination. Um, so the real question was, would it truly be a benefit for something like overall survival for the patients in that indication? And how could we best get that done quickly and simply with a very solid endpoint overall survival to demonstrate that benefit? So I think, you know, much of this is, is our own mindset when we look at trials. And we talk about looking at risk-based strategies within trials. I think we have to look at sort of complexity-based strategies. When do we need complexity? When do we know, do, do we not need it? When do we need certain strategies to streamline uh, the clinical trials so we can expand eligibility and so we can make sure, actually, that um, patients across the nation really can participate in the trials and we're not um, putting undue burdens on them. And we also make sure that the uh, strategy or the treatment strategy is actually being tested the way it eventually will be delivered if we show an advantage. And I think that's um, as equally important to all of us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Those are really great insights. Um, we, we spent also a lot of time in preparation of the paper talking and thinking about the boundaries. And by that, I mean the boundaries of when can we use a pragmatic element in a trial and, and when we cannot use it. Um, so, Sumitra, can I ask you to summarize what are some of the key characteristics we identified from a molecule or a clinical setting which would be which would make a pragmatic study more um, feasible? Um, thank you for that question, right? Clearly, as Meg noted, um, large simple trials are not for every setting, so pragmatic trials is not something that you can uh, envision for every, uh, for every uh, trial that, that is coming along. But if we are considering, um, I think this was also brought up earlier today, if we were considering uh, continuing the testing of a particular drug which is already approved in a different indication, 
or the individual drugs already are approved when you're looking at the combination for an example that Meg gave uh, now, or these are studies that um, are approved in some setting and you're trying to bring it forward. So you have a lot of information on the efficacy of the drugs, perhaps not in the exact population. You probably have a lot of information on the safety profile of these drugs. So those are the situation where you probably can start to think about, okay, now what are the elements that are amenable to making it a pragmatic trial? Because I have information on these drugs. I have information on the safety profile. So can I streamline the collection of uh, the safety data on these studies? And what is the endpoint I really want to focus on to Meg's point, you know, is it really overall survival? Uh, do I have to collect all the other, you know, efficacy endpoints? And even if you do want to collect something like disease status, could I, could I start to structure the data collection in a real world setting? Should I really try to understand whether the disease is responding, not responding, or somewhere in between, right? Instead of trying to use measurements and research and those sorts of things in um, solid tumors. So I think if we can, if we can think through every trial that comes forward, understand the, the landscape of those drugs, the landscape of where that is being launched, then we can actually ask the question, is this amenable to being a pragmatic question, uh, trial? And then we can streamline the data collection, whether it's uh, safety, whether it's efficacy, and whether it is um, endpoints. And, and, and the last thing for the pragmatic trials is also figuring out, I think I mentioned it earlier too, how do you align research and clinical care? How do you marry the data that goes into an electronic health record versus the data that goes into a research database? So these are all uh, the different things you can think about um, when you have a pragmatic trial option. Thank you. Um, one of the, the other example we spent a lot of time talking about is the eligibility criteria. And Erin, I think you have a lot of experience in this uh, within the LANC space. Could you share that as another example of the type of data which was, which gave us the confidence that in fact we could be um, um, broadening the, the eligibility criteria for some studies. Sure. So as far as pragmatic along, I mean, a large part of it came from, as Meg mentioned, we had a phase two randomized trial already of the combination, so we actually have some combination data. And these two drugs are, you know, pembrolizumab obviously is approved for multiple indications. Uh, Ramaceramab actually is, is approved for more than one indication as well. So when you have that sort of safety data, you become a lot more comfortable broadening the eligibility criteria um, as far as, you know, if you know what renal function patients can get the drug, hepatic function patient, you know, what you need for that. Um, but even for other trials, I mean, so we do small cell. A lot of small cell patients have poor performance status of two. We've been pushing for a long time to get that um, into trials. That's a harder ask, and it's understandably a harder ask for industry sometimes. You don't want to have patients with really poor performance status that may not benefit on the study if you're worried about the ultimate study results. But this, again, goes to the pragmatic design. If you're looking at OS at the end, you really do want to look at the patients who are going to be getting it in practice. That's a lot of patients with ECOG PS2. You may need to make your study a little bigger, but if you're broadening those eligibility criteria, enrollment will be easier. So again, it, we're not going to push anyone to necessarily go to ECOG PS2 or 3 in a phase one study, right, or in a first in human study. But the more experience you have with drugs or even a class of drugs, the more comfortable we're going to be with it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so within the paper, we, we talked, we, even though there are multiple dimensions of pragmatism, we focus, as we, we just referred to, on, uh, on some aspects of those pragmatic elements, eligibility criteria, um, we talked briefly about efficacy um, outcomes and safety evaluations. Now, Kristen, from a patient perspective, what kind of outcomes are most important of, for patients and, and that we should be considering bringing more into these pragmatic trials? Can you elaborate more a little bit on, on that aspect, please? Yes, thank you. So even before pragmatic trials begin, or I think any trials begin, having ongoing conversations between the providers and the patients is, is critically important really to get an understanding of how the patient wants to manage the treatment in relation to their life. 
the endpoint of a trial should be meaningful to patients and how they can actually live while they're on the drug. Overall survival is certainly valuable, but so are other endpoints like time to treatment discontinuation or time to next treatment. These composite endpoints are not only impacted by efficacy, but also tolerability, which is really important to patients as well. Perhaps having somebody with a, a strong background in palliative care could be essential or helpful in these early discussions between the patients and the provider so that everyone can really be on the same page before beginning. Thank you. Um, we also talked about endpoints, real-world endpoints that actually could be um, supportive for regulatory decisions. Can you share with us, Erin, some of those parameters of what would you like in, in order to make so those kind of decisions, what kind of endpoints, and we, in the paper we talked about a few different ones, mm -hmm. what kind of endpoints could be used for regulatory decision versus, for example, clinical um, um, guidelines? Yeah. So, you know, clearly for regulatory decision making, overall survival is a pretty easy one. Um, when it comes to things like the composite endpoints of uh, time to uh, next therapy, that's a little more complicated. They haven't really been validated as well as they would need to be to support regulatory decision making on their own. Um, the problem is most of the data we see from this is from retrospective studies as well, or where someone's comparing a progression-free survival from a single arm trial to real world data for time to disease progression. If these could be incorporated into even a pragmatic trial where the primary endpoint is OS, but you're also gonna look at these endpoints, prospectively randomized between two treatments, that would help generate the sort of data we would need to determine at some point, can these be used as sort of an early marker of clinical benefit for regulatory decision making potentially uh, to help inform that. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that space, but they're a useful thing to include. Once you start talking about more and more endpoints for pragmatic trials though, that's when, you know, when do you start moving away from it being pragmatic? Um, if it's an easy one to collect, then it may make sense to put it in there. And again, not every trial is gonna be as stripped down as you were able to make pragmatic along. So what we really wanna see is pragmatic elements being brought in um, across the board where feasible. Thank you. Boris, from an industry perspective, um, do you have any additional considerations on pragmatic dimensions which, which would be interesting from, for us to explore further? Um, well, let's like, talk a little bit about something we talked about within the group about what probably is not ready to be pragmatic too. I think there's a lot of discussion about how we look at endpoints that use uh, lesion assessments, right? And how that would uh, figure into it. And I, I think from the concept that um, pragmatic trials should be less burdensome to the site and kind of reflect routine clinical care, I think those are things that are difficult to do now from what we would probably want to get both from you know a scientific perspective as well as what industry would want and what the regulatory environment would want at that. And a lot of it comes down to just general you know, clinical principles of like when you do a trial, you want to have something that is, you know, the data is reliable. When the data gets read out, that it's interpretable and objective and generally free from bias. And I, I think with um, endpoints that measure, uh, you know, that rely on lesion measurements, such as response rate, progression-free survival, um, those require a level of verification that, you know, I think becomes a little bit more burdensome. So, you know, for instance, if you want to do response rates or progression-free survival, you have to, well, especially progression-free survival, you'll probably need to, like, ensure that if you have two arms of the trial, you're getting, you know, the assessments done at very similar time points. So very difficult if you have, for instance, a one arm where the cycle length is three weeks and the other cycle length is three, four or five weeks or something like that. That just add, absolutely adds, you know, um, 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 complexity to, to the design of the trial. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's the issue of, of, of inputting the data and, and how you can verify it, which would require the site to uh, have the infrastructure to input the data. Uh, you know, if you're looking at investigator assessment, the monitors have to go in there and view the, the assessments and verify that the response is correct. 
or if you send it to an uh, independent review committee to, to review, you have to figure out having the infrastructure to actually just send that out and, and get the read and be, be uh, prepared for queries that, that um, either the monitor or the BICR is going to have for you to, to answer these questions. So I think we talked a lot about the fact that probably at this point, um, sort of um, endpoints based on lesion measurements are probably not pragmatic. So, um, but I think I, I feel everyone else's endpoints, I think to the extent that we put other pragmatic design elements that I think are clinically relevant that could support work. And I think, again, it, it comes down to what can you do in the context of, of something that could be done in routine clinical practice that won't add additional burden to the sites. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, why, well, the paper didn't actually focus too much on data, the data component, Sumitra. I wonder if there's some elements that you can sort of uh, share with us in terms of the, the data component and high quality data. Uh, that we need to think about? Um, yes, so I think <laughs> this comes to really the operational and the logistical uh, aspects, right? We, we can all conceive a great idea and when the rubber meets the road, it's where you figure out that maybe that wasn't the best idea. <laughs> so, um, so the operational considerations for pragmatic trials, I think the first and foremost, like I was saying, a lot of the data collection we do on clinical trials is, is very research focused, which is good. But I think the more we talk with the sites and more we talk with the patients, I feel like we have to think, think about how we can align data collection to the real world. So for example, I'll give you an example that in, in our clinical trials, we collect data more cycle by cycle, but that's not an intuitive thing um, for when a physician is seeing a patient. Maybe they do patient encounters, right? So that's not necessarily cycle by cycle. So is there something we can do to streamline data collection where we can align uh, patient visits with the data collection for research? I think that's, that's a very important thing. The second one is also how does data go into the EMR? Is there a way that we can do more structured data collection in the EMR that will help with the data collection and research because I think some of the times our sites give feedback to us is you know what we have on a case report form isn't necessarily available readily in an EMR. It's probably a composite of several information that actually distills to a CRF data element. So I think, I think these are some things that we probably don't think of very carefully when we are, when we are launching a research clinical trial because we are looking at it from a research perspective, and I think the more we can marry research and practice uh, for pragmatic trials, I think that that's, that's, to me, that will be the winning strategy. Um, and then in terms of data collection itself, how much data are we collecting on our clinical trials? Again, in the pragmatic trial, if you have enough information on the safety profile, the question becomes how much adverse event data do you want to collect in a pragmatic trial? Is it enough if we just collect adverse events and efficacy that reflect real world outcomes. For example, any adverse event that leads to treatment discontinuation, right, for any reason. Maybe that's the most important data that you need to know, that it doesn't matter if it was a grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, but it just meant that the patient's unable to tolerate and have actually gone off uh, treatment. So thinking along those lines of, you know, what is the most important data element to collect that reflect real world outcomes, I think is important. Um, and finally, I will just make a statement that in, in addition to pragmatic trials itself, I think the NCI is also having an initiative where we are streamlining clinical trials, um, not just for these sorts of trials, but even late phase non-IND studies. It's called the Streamlining Clinical Trials Implementation Committee that came about um, from the, the, the CTAC uh, Streamlining Clinical Trials work group. So the, the whole impetus for that is to look through the data that we are collecting on clinical trials, take a hard look at what are those data that are actually utilized at the end of the study. To Boris's point, there's a lot of data that's collected, queried, cleaned, but are we truly utilizing it? Is the purpose of the data collection reaped at the end of the study or is it just data being collected? So there is a lot of these aspects that we are working through at this time in partnership with NCI and, and other stakeholders. Yeah. I think you're bringing an incredibly important topic of the fact that some, quite often we collect a, a lot more data than we actually need. And there's, a, of course, an ethical component there as well, right? If we collect data that we're not actually using. So I think that's incredibly important. Um, you also touched on points 
which um, call for a question from a global perspective, right, in terms of data um, and how do we collect the, the data and, and most of us uh, conduct, uh, most of the industries con conducting clinical studies globally, right? So we need to think about some of the global um, implementation of some of, of our studies in, at the global space. So Boris, uh, can, any specific um, thoughts related to doing global pragmatic trials? Oh, no. that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's touching a, like a whole different topic here. I mean, obviously, I think there are guidelines that are being put in place for global pragmatic trials right now. I think I see there are some ICHE6 guidelines mm -hmm. that kind of uh, highlight certain uh, aspects of, 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 of a pragmatic trial design, um, including, you know, in, in incorporating elements that we just, like, for instance, talked about right now. As yet, I don't know how they've been implemented in, in, in clinical trials. I don't, I'm not quite aware of those being uh, implemented yet. But yeah, everything that we talk about from a global perspective also has to take into account um, other regulatory groups, and I think specifically things like EU, and, and, and even more you know, recently Japan, and, and oftentimes you know, when we, we get the input from all different regulatory uh, um, groups, hopefully we come up with some consensus of what's considered practical to do in our clinical trials, and they can be different, and that's when we have interesting internal discussions about how we should uh, execute a trial. Thank you. All right, so um, we have a few more minutes before we can go to the Q&A. And um, I would like to ask each panelist now to share uh, with the audience, um, what do you think is needed? If we think about the future, what do you think is needed to increase adoption of trials with pragmatic elements, and especially for trials with regulatory intent? Erin, would you like to start? Sure. So, you know, for regular intent, the, the most important thing for companies, I, I think, is that we are open to these. We encourage them. The most important part is to come engage with us early and often. Not every trial is necessarily going to be able to have every pragmatic element in it. Um, even for safety, you know, we'll need to work out what can be collected. If there's a concern for overlapping toxicity, maybe we'll ask for a little bit of collection of specific a, you know, adverse events of special interest. But that doesn't mean we need all the same data that we would for any other trial. So early engagement with us from the regulatory perspective is the most important. Um, I know we've talked about uh, the global nature of these trials. We engage with international regulators all the time. I, I think they may be more open to some of these than you think they are, particularly when we're talking about things where if you're really just gonna try to look for overall survival. That's what a huge part of their approvals are based on, especially in the um, countries where it's National Health Service and, and the coverage is uh, managed in a different way than it is here. Thank you. Boris. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I've been in the industry for 21 years, so I, I think there's like a lot of improvements that have actually been made. And I think from experience, I, I know that there was a lot we can do internally as well. I mean, we have tremendous discussions with our regulatory group, our quality group, about what should be collected and whether or not it should be collected and what's pragmatic. You know, we've had multiple discussions, for instance, about collecting of both local labs and central labs when the labs are basically the same, right? And and and, and I think. Finally, we seem to be moving after my 20 years here <laughs> to like saying we can just collect one or the other. You don't have to collect necessarily both, right? Uh, so I think that's a, that's a win. Uh, like um, Aaron said, a lot of this is discussions we have to have with the FDA because a lot of times a lot of these discussions we have internally have to go with, oh, the FDA is not going to allow this or the FDA will allow this or the EU won't allow this. Or not, you know? and so like how do you engage these agencies to understand what's allowed and not, I think is an important part of it. Um, and then I think, you know, as we start including pragmatic elements, I, I, I think we should start, you know, internally thinking about, um, you know, what sites that we normally don't go to that we can start going to now uh, with you know, the idea that some of these elements now may make it um, uh, less burdensome for sites to think about enrolling patients on trial. So I don't think we should, uh, like, hinder ourselves in saying, hey, we normally go to these sites for, for patients, may, maybe now with these additional um, considerations we can go to those states as well. And I think from a sort of you know, future perspective, I think as our technologies improve, I think you know, Sumitra was talking about better EHRs and being able to incorporate 
in what the data comes from EHI and migrate into clinical trial databases, that would be great, right? I, I think that would be something that would probably help to um, you know, um, move trials to currently not you know, typical clinical trial sites. Thank you. Sumitra, your wish list. <laughs> well, Boris actually spoke for all of us. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I, I, I think three points I'll make. One is I think that the endpoint that we choose has to be well-defined and reproducible. It's one thing to have, you know, to think of pragmatic trials and trying to simplify, but we want an endpoint that's well-defined and reproducible. Um, I think adverse events, if you go the, you know, to thinking about adverse events, they have to reflect real-world outcomes, right? So how much adverse events and data do we really want to collect that's meaningful, that's impactful, that's patient-centric, and that's clinically relevant? So that's the second aspect. And I think the third aspect is to really, really think about focused and streamlined data collection. Um, these trials can be simpler, um, we can make it simpler, and, and the more we can put effort into thinking about why there is a dis disconnect between research and how practice and how data is going into the EMR, I think we can, we can try to align ourselves, marry ourselves together instead of being on two parallel tracks. For, for many times, I feel like this is you know, two parallel tracks, and the more we can try to integrate, I think that will serve as well. Thank you. Kristen. Well, we all certainly know that there's increased administrative responsibility these days on care providers, prompting the consideration for um, innovative solutions such as the, the pragmatic trials. And with pragmatic trials, ideally, there could be less burden on both patients and sites, which might prompt sites to be able to participate. Involving the patient and the advocate voice right from the beginning in helping planning pragmatic trials could help ensure that they're less burdensome on patients and ideally achieve the goal everyone is there for. Additionally, one approach could be elevating patient navigators within the healthcare system. Navigators could assist providers from an administrative standpoint at sites that aren't typically familiar with hosting clinical trials. And if they're responsible for comprehending and amplifying the patient voice for their individual situations and helping to navigate their life situations, navigators could potentially play a pivotal role in helping facilitate the pragmatic trials. Nick. Okay, well, I don't think I can add too much more to <laughs> everything everyone said so far. I think for us, since we um, at the NCI support both IND and non-IND uh, trials. As Sumitra said, um, we try to look at something we can apply across the spectrum and make sure that we're including what we learn as we conduct the trials from the sites and what the sites and the physicians are hearing from their patients. Um, and so we've taken a systematic approach. So something like broadening um, patient eligibility. Initially, we started out just giving recommendations you should consider this, you should. And then we found that, that there wasn't much adoption of that <laughs> when you suggested. And then we started saying, we're going to review that as something that we really need to think about. And so systematically, on both our early phase as well as our late phase trials, for every review, we go through to say, what are the um, broadening eligibility criteria that could be applied here? And when we did it systematically, even though we had to have discussions, particularly with pharmaceutical companies, <laughs> which you know, pushed back a, a bit on the early phase clinical trials in particular, but we found actually much more consensus than one would expect. Mm -hmm. And at least we were able to have the dialogue and decide when that was appropriate and when it wasn't. And the same thing with trying to align the, the data collection for what you really need to collect in the, in the trial, as well as the endpoints. But I think it's that systematic um, attention to it, because I think otherwise, without that, if we're just recommending this would be a good idea or nice to do, um, we lose focus on that. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the approach we've taken. It does take more time to some extent at the beginning, but I think we're all um, able to reap uh, tremendous uh, uh, benefits from doing that and having these types of trials when appropriate. Wonderful. Thank you very much for all your insights in terms of what we need to do next. Uh, we now have 15 minutes for um, discussion. Are there any questions from the audience? Maybe we can start. Yes. Thank you. 
Ooh, I don't have a question. I have a bit of a, a statement. First of all, thank you very, very much um, for this panel. It's very informative and important. I hope the word gets out. Um, we collect too much data, and we know it, and we have to really look at what is important, just generally, not just on pragmatic trials, but as being very involved with Pragmatica. Uh, it really wouldn't have happened without leadership. Uh, Rick Pastor, Harpreet Singh, NCI embraced it. It took some work with companies and it took some work with the cooperative groups in terms of not adding a Christmas tree to it. It was like, might as well, might as well, might as well. Also, the other part of it that was important is really the informed consent, making it easy. Uh, really, that's a, it's just impossible for a patient to understand or to comprehend all this information. So I know that we can't make every trial pragmatic trial, but I just want to leave a message of leadership. If FDA and NCI and others don't really make this part of the culture and the cultural change, it won't happen because this happened because of leadership. So, uh, you know, I don't know that it needs an answer, but it's just a message for the future. Thank you. That's a very important message. Thank you. Um, there is one. So uh, there's one also question here from the web um, for a, from Julie Brennan uh, for a clinical trial to further characterize safety and efficacy in racial and ethnic subpopulations underrepresented in the registrational trial. Yeah. Which pragmatic elements might be more appropriate, given that there may not be robust existing data in that patient population? Um, I think there is a site kind of a, a component on this question. Um, so, <laughs> who is, would someone like to take it? Um, I mean, I can speak from the FDA perspective. We do um, sometimes ask for additional post-marketing studies, actually, in such subgroups if they were not studied. Um, unfortunately, we're still, as much as we've been pushing for diversity in clinical trials, and that's not just FDA, that's everywhere we've been pushing, it still is not where it needs to be when we get these trial results in. Um, so again, I think it would depend on the data you do have in hand. Usually even when there's small numbers um, of the subpopulations in the registrational trial, there is some data across the program usually, pharmacokinetic type data for us to know safety-wise, do we expect major differences? So that's the sort of trial where maybe you could really look at just grade three, four, serious adverse events, discontinuation, to see if there are any major safety signals would be what you're looking for that differ. Not that grade one and two toxicities aren't important, they're vitally important to patients, but that's generally, as a clinician, I don't look at those that much in the label. That's something the patient and I deal with because every patient has a different tolerance and it depends on the actual toxicity they're having. So I think that's one where you could definitely do some stripped down um, safety collection. Um, we generally don't do full efficacy studies in populations unless we have a good reason or biologic rationale or signal to think that there would be differential efficacy. So that part's a little more difficult to answer. Thanks, Aaron. So I'm going to let's take another question. Okay, great, from uh, Charles from Bennett, uh, leading uh, radar and sonar pharmacovigilance, and also at City Hope as an adjunct. Um, I lead safety for the last 20, 30 years, been responsible for 57 black box warnings. And what I've learned through my work on safety is, is no longer, the goal is not to be there the first or the quickest. It's trying to be there actually on time. But so as we get to pragmatic trials, we don't need to be over, overly pushing on all these adverse events that might not take 15 years to really show up given the populations we work in. And so the perfect is the enemy of the good. The second question I would bring up is, as you talked about international regulatory, we've also asked the question, how do you disseminate what kind of pragmatic findings you have? And we were trying to find an umpire, and last week we found an umpire. Our umpire is called ChatGPT. <laughs> and, and what we did with the umpire is, we took the side effect that we're working on, and we asked ChatGPT, US, an adverse event that we had, and how does it work? And ChatGPT says, the information is diffuse and un uninterpretable. <laughs> then we asked ChatGPT to do the same experiment in England and got an A+. Plus. <laughs> it's a, so sometimes it might be worth it, and there's something to be said for actually less is best. 
I want to know if you guys are thinking about potentially the uh, international potential and also the AI potential. Can we make simpler pragmatic trials now that we have um, an extra hand? <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure I, I understand the question. <laughs> are, are you asking, should we take advantage of the fact that obviously a lot of times this is a global you know, trial and, and therefore we should try to answer these questions from a global perspective? Yes, I think that's something we want to understand, obviously. Um, you know, there are diversity everywhere and I think I, uh, you know, we would like to find those states that we would normally not go to and incorporate them in ways that we can. Um, I, I do think there is sort of an element of um, comfort level with what the sites can deliver. Um, part of it because we just, sometimes we just don't know and it's even harder when you go abroad to like evaluate a site and say, hey, this site can re provide reliable data. Um, and so, um, and so, so that has to enter into the equation as well. But yeah, I think in the general principle, yes, we would love to go to places that we don't normally go, um, you know, to increase the diversity of the population. So. Yeah, multiple components have to come into that assessment. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll take a question from the right. Hi, I'm Sunita Zalani from Merck. Um, you know. Uh, First of all, excellent panel and uh, very good insights. I, w I had a question about endpoints. Um, as you know, for lung pragmatica, uh, which is registration intent, overall survival was the endpoint. But as we think of other endpoints, sometimes PFS, EFS may be more suitable for pragmatic study designs. and. I was wondering if a PFS, EFS assessment by a physician, and in most instances a community physician, would be considered an appropriate endpoint for pragmatic trials for registration intent. Thank you. So for, for <laughs> registrational intent, that's a difficult ask and that would need a lot of discussion. It's sort of PFS and EFS as mentioned before, sorry, they're not pragmatic endpoints. Part of the issue is, you know, in practice, if I see a patient and they're going on a cruise, I'm going to push their scan back two weeks because I'm not going to make them come, you know, cancel their vacation. In clinical practice, because if it's the primary endpoint we're relying on, the timing has to be the same across all the studies. We already have significant concordance issues with PFS reading when IRCs read them compared to investigators. So. That's, it's not a very pragmatic endpoint, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I, I don't know much more I can say from that perspective. But again, that's why we're talking about not every trial, registration trial, has to be purely pragmatic. If you have a trial with EFS as an endpoint, maybe there's safety elements that you can look at a lot differently, right? Um, so, you know, there, there are different ways to approach it. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Mo Zahid. Um, I work at a machine learning software company called Schedulo. And one of the use cases that we've had where we saw a lot of success was during COVID and the uh, efficacy and efficiency of getting vaccines into patients. And based on some of the conversations that we're having today, um, based on the pragmatic trials, at least one of the thoughts that comes to my mind is looking at a pragmatic platform or a solution uh, specifically around technology that allows you to tag certain data points that you value, streamline the data collection like you mentioned, um, and, and monitor not just the QA of um, each trial and each patient, but being able to remotely monitor the, monitor the efficacy um, using that type of technology. Is that something that you guys have looked into um, that would even be of interest that you think maybe could help bringing in technology into a use case that maybe has been slow to adopt, um, you know, the standardization and automation of what's possible. So I, I, we, we talked at, for, in this panel, we talked uh, about how can we use technologies, how could, could technologies be used, for example, for automation of, and data transfer, but we didn't go into in depth in those kind of discussions. I don't know if any of the panelists do have something to say, or maybe if we could take it offline. 
Um, so, no, that is a very good point, right? How can we leverage technology to help streamline data collection? And today, even though we have a lot of um, electronic research databases, the data that goes into it is pretty much manually entered, right? So there's not a great way for us to push data from the EMR to an EDC, electronic data capture system. Or even if it is there, it's only certain data elements, they are, you know, are they curated? Do we have issues with the quality of the data that's coming in? So I think, I think technology has its place as long as we first align the data points and the data elements that we are collecting and how data is going into the EMR, right? That's very, very important. I think where we miss the boat is many times we say we can't extract this data or we extract this data and it's not consistent because if you think even about EPIC, every institution probably has a version of EPIC, right? They take what's standardly provided and they institutionalize it for what works for their institution. So then now to to go in and, and put a, a, a software to kind of extract that data, it, you're not gonna get consistent data. So I think technology definitely has a place, but we first have to get there. We have to try to align all of us together to say, okay, this is exactly how I'll capture age. This is how I'll capture gender. This is how I'll capture outcomes. I don't think we are there yet for every community site and for en every institution, but if we can get there, I think technology can play wonders. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, I think we are on time. Um, we, we are going to be, I think there, I see another gentleman there who would like to ask us a question maybe at, at the break we'll be happy to, to um, address it. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Friends of Cancer Research uh, for, for this, uh, uh, for inviting us to, to come together and explore how we can introduce more pragmatic elements in our clinical trials um, and for being here today. And also the, the panelists for, for today and a, and a wonderful, having a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the discussion. What you didn't see on the other side is she actually hit this to the second, which I'm not sure I've uh, ever seen that precision in moderating. Um, but <laughs> uh, we're going to break now for, uh, for lunch. Um, we will take about a half hour um, to the second. Um, lunch is... Uh, lunch is right outside. There are several different stations. Um, please take the opportunity to take the break. Um, at 1.15, uh, we will come back sharply um, and are very excited for an update panel of several OCE projects um, that Dr. Pazder and co colleagues will be uh, leading at 1.15 uh, right back here. In the meantime, please feel free to bring your lunch back into the room here, um, and then there will be people to uh, help clear as we get started again in a half hour. So thank you very much. We'll see you soon.
afternoon as we prepare for our lunch. Could the panelists please come to the rear of the room for the microphone? Thank you. Good afternoon. As we prepare for the next panel, could the panelists please come to the rear corner of the room to the microphone? Thank you. Thank you. 
If everyone could please find their seats, we'll be getting ready uh, to get started in one minute. Thank you. Welcome back. Hope you had a good lunch and didn't eat too much so you don't go to sleep but I don't think this panel will let you sleep. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to welcome my friend and co-founder of Friends of Cancer Research, Marlene Malik. Hey, Marlene. <laughs> so we have a very interesting panel here led by Rick Pastor. You can absolutely guarantee it won't be boring. And uh, you can also guarantee that it will be innovative because Rick doesn't let anybody sleep. Nothing will happen. He has extraordinary ideas that will get executed for the benefit of patients. Um, uh, we didn't talk enough about the OCE earlier on when we talked about uh, all of us working very, very hard. Friends of Cancer Research worked really hard in 21st Century Cures to get it um, in legislation. So it's the integration and elevation of cancer at FDA, and we're very proud of it. And now I will stop talking and bring it over to Rick and the panel. Uh, well, thank you very much, Alan. Could I show the slide of the projects? Uh, I think people might be interested in seeing it. Uh, we have many projects in the OCE, and this is just some of them. Uh, they all have their own kind of little logo that goes along with it. Uh, but I thought it's nice to see them all together, or at least most of them all together. Now, many of these projects have received a lot of publicity, and we talk a lot about them. Uh, Project Pragmatica, for example, we were talking about just uh, uh, an hour before, before lunch, and then obviously Project Optimus uh, has received a lot of, uh, of press, so to speak, regarding uh, looking at different dosing uh, philosophies in uh, developing oncology drugs. But I thought what we could do today is take a look at some of the projects uh, that really are very important projects, but may sometimes not be always in the limelight. And this is my opportunity to give very talented people that work at the FDA a chance to showcase, showcase uh, their projects. Um, and so what I'm going to ask is everybody to introduce themselves, okay, and just a few lines about your project, okay, and what the project is, starting with Rhea. Hi, everybody. I'm Rhea Blakey. I'm the Associate Director for External Outreach and Engagement at the Oncology Center of Excellence and happy to be there. Work primarily with advocates, and my project is Project Community, which, um, as the name indicates, full-fledged, 
We are engaged with all levels of community. So um, engagement is really what we do. I'll stop there. Mitch. My name is Mitchell Chan. I'm a clinical analyst with the OCE and Project Facilitate. Our program is very unique in that we focus on oncology expanded access. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more soon. Angelo. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Angelo DeClaro. I'm a hematologist oncologist. And the program I'll be covering today is Project Orbis, uh, which is our uh, a program that, that we do together with international regulators, other international regulators. Gotham. Hi, I'm Gotham Mehta. I'm a tumor neurosurgeon and uh, acting clinical team lead in the Division of Oncology 2. Um, and uh, I'm the project lead for Project Confirm. And Project Confirm it basically manages the data uh, behind our uh, accelerator approval initiatives. Um, and so very much like some of the efforts that Friends of Cancer Research has done, um, publishing uh, data sets and databases of uh, accelerator approvals granted in oncology. And finally, Jeff. So my name is uh, Jeff Summers. And um, a very long time ago, I was a pediatric oncologist and a creative scientist. For the last 20 years, I've been at the FDA. Um, and for the last four years, I've been working on uh, Project Catalyst, uh, and it's been some of the best four years of, uh, that I've had at the FDA. Um, Project Catalyst is uh, designed to help small companies and academic accelerators uh, develop their novel paradigm changing, maybe, uh, new <laughs> oncology therapies. Okay, hey, let's start with Angela. We just got back from a trip to, from Japan, rather, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that trip and why we went there, and do you have any announcements to make or anything? <laughs> Sure, ha happy to do that, uh, Rick. So uh, as Rick mentioned, like uh, we just got back from our uh, travel to, to Japan. Uh, we participated a few sessions at DIA Japan and met with the ca our counterparts there, the uh, PMDA, and also met with multiple stakeholders, uh, including uh, members from pro professional organizations, patient advocacy groups, academia, such a, a busy schedule that, that we had. Uh, I'm still recovering from, from, from jet lag. So uh, what I'm happy to share with you today is that, uh, so PMDA and FDA OCE have uh, reached agreement for regarding uh, greater collaboration regarding oncology uh, drug development, and PMDA has uh, agreed to participate as an observer in, in Project Orbis. You want to just tell us a little bit about Project Orbis for those people that are, unf are not familiar with it and the scope, uh, what countries are involved and uh, numbers of applications, et cetera, because it really is probably, for those of uh, you that are not aware of it, one of what I term one of my achievements in OCE as far as helping create this, and I think Angelo has been the major force here uh, with the staff to really uh, bring this to fruition, really, this project. And when you hear the numbers, it's quite impressive. Yeah, so, so we started the, the program four years ago. It was an idea from Rick, and Rick just came and, why don't we do this? And um, we got the, the wheels uh, going, and pretty soon we had the program up and running, initially with Canada and Australia. Um, it took a, uh, a few months for us to get the, uh, our processes uh, going. Uh, currently, there are eight countries, including the U.S., that are our Project Orbis uh, member countries. So it's the U.S., Australia, Canada, Singapore, Switzerland, uh, Brazil, Israel, and, and the U.K. Um, this year, uh, both uh, uh, the European Medicines Agency and PMDA have uh, expressed their interest to observe with, uh, with Project Orbis to see uh, the, how we uh, conduct this program. Uh, and just to give you an update on like, the number of just the, the scope of, of this program, to date, 400 marketing applications have been uh, submitted across the eight uh, regulatory agencies and have led to about 350 regulatory actions. Um, this, this, consider, this is about like uh, about 40% of the FDA uh, OCE workload is being referred for, for Project Orbis. The submission gaps and action gaps to FDA have also been remarkable. The median submission gap across all of the Orbis applications is just one month to the FDA submission timeline. And the action gap is about a median of six months. So certainly these numbers are are, 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 are very remarkable considering that previously some of these other agencies were not even getting the drugs or were dealing with drug lags of about 12 to 24 months. Yeah. Wow. 
So I, I really think that this is where really an accomplishment of the staff that worked very hard on this to really coordinate the activities. And also uh, the review divisions have been uh, very instrumental in uh, discussions uh, with these uh, regulators, uh, both in terms of additional meetings and inviting them uh, into uh, the FDA's decision-making process here. Obviously, we could have different decisions by these countries. We're not lockstep or locked in a decision. Uh, all of the countries make their own independent decisions. We're going to have to flip around here because this is kind of uh, a potpourri of different projects here. So let's go. Why is Thursday an important day for you, Gotham? Oh, yes. So, so Thursday is <laughs> a very important day for Project Confirm um, because we're holding an advisory committee meeting, so an ODAC meeting, um, that's going to focus on uh, delayed confirmatory trials after accelerator approval. And, uh, and so this is... Uh, Again, this is part of a kind of the broader scope of Project Confirm, where we're trying to really analyze our outcomes with this accelerator approval program in oncology. And um, on Thursday, we want to specifically focus on this topic of uh, the delay after uh, to verification of benefit after accelerator approval is granted. And um, you know, Rick, Rick, you and I have talked about uh, the risks of accelerator approval uh, quite often. The accelerator approval balances early access uh, to effective therapies with this risk that, um, uh, that clinical benefit may not be verified by confirmatory trials. And so part of that factor, uh, part of what factors into that risk is the time to verification of benefit and how quickly these confirmatory trials get done. Uh, so on Thursday, we're gonna talk a little bit about this risk. We're gonna talk about its impact. And we'll also talk about some um, some strategies to mitigate this risk, uh, which I think will be uh, of interest and relevant to a lot of people in this room. Um, we'll also be talking about a couple uh, accelerator approval uh, that have been granted that are actually the oldest uh, ongoing accelerator approvals in oncology, uh, and uh, they both have delayed confirmatory trials. And you'll hear more about this in great detail on Thursday. So. Hope you'll tune in. It's going to be on, live on YouTube on Thursday, and then it'll be recorded as well. Yeah, and all of our updated numbers will be available. And I, I think Project Confirm is an excellent website because you could go to it and you have, uh, you know, real updated information because that's being updated continuously every time we take a regulatory action. So there's no delays in it. So you could see exactly what the timelines are, uh, what drugs were approved under accelerated approval, what are the commitments, and they're updated, as I said, on a real-time basis at, on the day that we send letters to companies regarding regulatory actions. But I think one of the major things that we're going to try to get across is the importance of having the confirmatory trials ongoing at the time of approval. Obviously, the applications that we've had that have been our so-called, I won't use the word problems, I'll use the politically correct word challenges, okay, uh, are those that have not had the accelerated approval or the confirmatory studies ongoing. Uh, and that is a major problem, and we really want to send a clear message that these trials need to be ongoing. We're writing guidance at the present time of what ongoing means, but let me tell you folks, it's not just one patient on the trial or that, that the trial has been activated at sites. We really want companies to come before they begin any trials to discuss timelines, uh, agreed upon timelines, both of the accelerated approval study plus the confirmatory trials. I don't know if you have any yeah, more words and, on that. And, and you know, we, we've uh, talked about this in other settings, but uh, there's a clear association between whether or not uh, a confirmatory trial is ongoing at the time of accelerated approval and the time it takes to verify clinical benefit. So, it, there's actually uh, almost a four-year ad advantage in verification of benefit if that trial is ongoing at the time accelerated approval is granted. And, and there, there are many different strategies that we'll discuss on, on Thursday to trying to promote enrollment and, and, um, and get these trials done in a timely fashion. But uh, this, is, this is really important. And what we're really hoping to do here is minimize the risks of accelerator approval while still leveraging the positive benefits for patients with cancer. So I, I think uh, it's going to be a really interesting discussion. And you know, one of the things we were taking a look at the numbers, and maybe you want to give these about the number of indications that were removed versus the number of drugs that were removed via uh, the accelerator when 
confirmatory studies uh, have, quote, failed, unquote. Yeah. As they're a bit different, and many people confuse uh, the indications that we remove versus the drug that we removed. And yeah. We, 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 we've been talking a lot about the, you know, how do we measure success of the accelerator approval program? And, you know, one of the ways that people think about it is how many, um, how many um, of these accelerator approvals go on to verify clinical benefit versus how many are withdrawn. I think you know, uh, often the number uh, of withdrawals that is cited, so there, there have been 26 uh, withdrawals of indications for accelerator approvals uh, versus 187 accelerator approvals granted in oncology. However, only nine of those indications were uh, in instances where it was for a uh, uh, new molecular entity or, or essentially the product was removed from the market. So in the majority of cases, even in those withdrawals, the drug is still on the market um, so, so when we uh, compare those nine against the number of new molecular entities that were granted accelerator approval, I think it was 107. So we're talking about an 8% withdrawal rate. Of the drug. Uh, in those, yeah, of the drug actually coming off the, the One market. of the reasons I was very interested in presenting the data as far as the drugs that were removed, remember that the EU conditional approval is only for a new molecular entity and not for indication. So it gives some parallelism to the uh, both conditional approval of the EU as well as the uh, accelerated approval for the United States. Okay, we're jumping to Jeff. Okay, Jeff, tell us about Project Catalyst, what's going on. It was kind of your idea. Oh, no, 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 it was your idea. So, so <laughs> it was, about four years ago, I got the opportunity and the privilege to, to do this. And like I said, it's been some of the most fun times I've had at the FDA. Um, you know, and obviously started by Dr. Pazder and by uh, uh, Gidon Blumenthal, who's now at Merck, and the director uh, of the program is Mark Thierry. And, uh, I think it stemmed out of the fact that it's become obvious that you know more and more, uh, a, more, more and more smaller and smaller companies are developing oncology drugs, particularly not only from inception but all the way through to approval. And um, I, I think I, I enjoy it. I think it's great because it's kind of like the democratization of anti-cancer therapy development. Uh, you know, right down to the, the postdoctoral fellows. Uh, uh, a lab bench, and I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm flabbergasted sometimes at the advances in science and technology today that that have you know literally been able to you know dissect and interrogate you know neoplastic processes and pathways, and then translate those those insights, those observations into into anti-cancer therapies, but but with that you know faster translation and uh, uh, um, comes a, a lot less experience. With the, uh, with the enterprise of drug development. And as like, you all know, that enterprise can be um, relatively uh, complicated. So, so I think that's you know, where, where, the, where the impetus and initiative was, uh, was inspired from. The, you know, I think the OCE, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm impressed with the OCE in that they, they have a lot of uh, you know, forward thinking. And you know, one of the, I think one of the things that OCE thinks, which is kind of along the lines of the NCAAP back in the 1970s, was you know, a, uh, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And I think we think that you know, a, 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 a novel anti-cancer therapy is a lamentable thing to languish or sit on a shelf. Um, so we've developed this program that you know, attempts to you know, f uh, create a space that fosters uh, you know, in, uh, informal scientific discussion for academic accelerators, for small companies where people can uh, ha have information and get, get some guidance on their, on their drug development programs where it's, uh, it's non-binding um, and it's, it's uh, not, you know, imagine that, you know, most of the times that interactions with the FDA are rather sometimes stilted. The sentences are parsed out. They're carefully crafted comments. Um, lots of agreements, it almost feels a little bit legal, and this was to try to have a much more open discussion. And this is up into, you know, the first, uh, the pre-IND stage, so kind of close to first in human studies, pre-IND, um, and then once you have a formal meeting, you know, with FDA, then you need to, yeah. you have to go through those yeah through those uh, kind of I can't tell you how many times I've had calls from not only small companies, but um, academic investigators, and here again, this is a part of the project also is to interact with them. Uh, just basic 
basic regulatory information that they need because they really don't, they lack it or uh, especially what some of the smaller biotech companies may not have, you know, regulatory departments that are fully flushed out, so to speak. But uh, this was really one of our goals is really to, to really provide that assistance. And it can't be just a single phone call. Many times these are longer acting, longer discussions. With so, so if I can jump in there, we have three real programs or activities or, that we use to try to achieve this. And one of those is uh, aid meetings, uh, otherwise the OREG program, and the other one are bench to bedside, bench to bedside chats. But uh, the aid meetings are accelerator innovation discussion meetings. And they're kind of like speed dating sessions where your academic accelerator gets to come you know, meet with FDA, meet with product folks, meet with CMC folks, meet with uh, toxicologists, meet with CBER. Um, and, and I gotta have, have to point this out here because even though OCE is fantastic, there are a whole bunch of, uh, there are other centers, there are other offices, there are other divisions, and it's all a, it's a huge collaboration and cooperation. And these guys all have day jobs. My day job is this, but, but their day job is to do other work and then it's all pro bono the activities that they, that they provide for, uh, yeah. for Project Catalyst. But those aid, those aid meetings are kind of like speed dating sessions where we, we get uh -huh. to interact with, a project team, with four project teams, it's 90 minutes, 20 minutes a, a piece, but they get, to, they get to see that the FDA is not this, as someone pointed out earlier, meet with FDA frequently and often and as soon as you can, and they get to see that the FDA is in a black box and it's not something to be uh, fearful of, but that we're actually there trying to help. And, and I think that's important. And here again, I wanted to highlight this program because many of you are unaware of it. Uh, and it's one that we really want to cultivate. And we believe that the time is well spent because here again, we do not want applications coming in or confusion regarding some of these earlier drug development points. And you know, sometimes very early uh, discussions can avoid a lot of misdirected work. Let's next go to Mitch's program, uh, Project Facilitate. Uh, let's talk about that, Mitch. What are the points you want uh, to people to take home on this project? Yeah, thanks, Rick. Um, the Project Facilitate is a very unique program. It's something that's very novel, uh, at least definitely to me. And this really came about when, when Rick had this idea that we wanted to create. They're not all my ideas, folks. Kind of a theme here. <laughs> But it was really a, an idea that started a while ago where, um, where we wanted to have physicians to have a concierge service, a, a, a pathway for them to call up the FDA, to get a human on the phone, to be able to get personalized support, whether it's them as the oncologist or the regulatory team, whether it's a nurse, a pharmacist, or someone within the regulatory office. And we understand that the, the regulatory pathway for oncology expanded access can sometimes be a little confusing for those who have never gone through it before. And so Project Facilitate started as a way that we can provide that individualized, personalized service to each of those healthcare providers and regulatory professionals. And after, so when we first started, it was in 2019, uh, we, we launched this as a national call center. So this was a way that uh, the public can give us a call and you can get a hold of a regulatory expert immediately to aid you through the process, fill out the forms, tell you what you need to do and where to submit everything. Now, since 2019, Project Facilitate has grown exponentially. And the ways that we've grown has ranged from the services we provide to uh, our outreach that we are currently doing. And with Project Facilitate, it's really interesting to see that since the beginning, we turned from a call center and expanded to also reviewing applications in-house. And the reason why that's so important is because by reviewing that in-house with Project Facilitate, so we have regulatory and clinical experts in Project Facilitate doing this, is that we've re reduced the review times for expanded access applications by over 90%. So we're talking from an average of five days for us to review our year application, and when Project Facilitate started taking over that review process, it's reduced down to, on average, about 24 hours or, or lower. So with- I think that's worth applause, yeah. Thank you. In addition, some really interesting things that we've seen through the years is the increase in utilization of expanded ac or oncology expanded access, especially through Project Facilitate. And, and this is definitely in thanks to uh, a lot of our staff members. We're, we're a very small team. We only have five uh, members within Project Facilitate that we're pushing this project forward. 
And the way that we are pushing it forward is by expanding the ways of reducing barriers to not just patients, but also to healthcare professionals and regulatory personnel. And the way we're doing this is, for example, uh, there's this thing called the e-request portal, which is an online digital portal that we created that people can just go and log into and submit their digital applications, whether it's for oncology or not, actually. And, uh, but for oncology specifically, this has helped us uh, tremendously throughout the years in being able to help the public access expanded access a little bit easier than before. Uh, you know, the expanded access program has always been a quagmire, basically, for many people, and that's why we uh, took it out of the divisions, basically, so it offloaded a lot of work from the divisions and put it into its own specialized unit with people that handle this on a daily basis, a number that you could call, uh, because it was very confusing for most of clinicians uh, who to call, how to get it, unless you were at a major medical center. And I think one of the things you've emphasized is we're getting a lot more low local physicians calling, people outside of the MD Andersons, the Memorial Sloan Kettering's, the major cancer centers actually applying for single patient INDs. And this was one of the goals of that program really is kind of a democratization of the expanded access program for all patients. Uh, you know, I, I knew we had to do something because uh, many years ago, I actually had two separate NCI directors call me and say, Rick, uh, like, how do we maneuver this? This program, this expanded access, the single patient INDs. I have no, no idea who to call, what to do, help me with this. And I said, well, hell, if the NCI director doesn't know what to do here, we're in a pretty big problem. How would a local community hospital physician in Kankakee, Illinois or something know how to do this? So we really felt we needed to um, really devote resources to this. And I think that this has been really one of the uh, biggest uh, pleasures of my life, really, to see this program come, come to some fruition. And talking about another pleasure, Rhea, yeah. tell me about Project Community and some of the new involvement that we have. And obviously, you have mel multiple programs here. We have the international program, Project Orbis. We have Project uh, Community. And sometimes we see some mixing here. We yes. do. OK, I, I got it. I'm up on the uptake here. You got it. You so got the lead in specific here. specific to uh, Conversations on Cancer is one of the programs. And, and again, all these are Rick's idea. I don't care what he says. It's true. They are. Um, Ellen was right. He is the master innovator, and he's great with taglines and titles, etc. So, you know, if you need him for marketing purposes, I'm sure he I missed my time. job. I should have been on, on Madison Avenue. Yeah. But we're happy to have him. Uh, at OCE, and because of him, we do have something called Conversations on Cancer, again, Rick Pazder idea, which really is a public panel discussion series that we do. We do uh, all kinds of topics that are related to issues that might actually be social and related to cancer, or might have to do with um, geography and related to cancer, rural versus urban uh, access and related to cancer. So cancer is the key, but the conversation could be a variety of things. And the segue that he's looking for me to mention is specific to uh, the part where we've recently collaborated with the European Medicines Agency, the EMA, uh, to start doing some uh, conversation on cancer in collaboration with them. So we had the first one in October. It was specific to breast cancer, because it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We're gonna have another one in February, uh, basically tagging into World Cancer Day, but talking about a variety of therapeutic areas. And again, this sort of cross-pollinization of, we wanted to make sure that we had advocates that were domestic as well as international. Um, so we did have some people from Europe who participated as well, academics, researchers, oncologists. And the idea being that, you know, it's a global world. Cancer patients are everywhere, as well as cancer advocates. And people can talk about all kinds of issues that impact all of us in the same space. So we're looking forward to really expanding that. Yeah, and, and I think the collaboration with Europe, we obviously, Angelo and I went to, to Europe. When was it? May. It sounds like all we do is they travel. travel. Yeah. yeah, like, <laughs> he's the best travel agent I know. I say. Angelo, take me here, and it's there, <laughs> okay. Uh, but when we went there, it was very interesting, uh, the, the interest that they had in greater collaboration, and this was relatively uh, a easy project to do, in mm -hmm. a sense, that let's just bring the patient communities together, uh, and we're actually thinking about other projects. 
Ah, so uh, can I say the title? Is that yes? Okay? That's okay. All right. And that's your idea. Your 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 uh, the name is your idea. Yes, but now I'm going to mess it up because I feel pressure. Connect. Um, thank Connect. you, Project Connect. That was my idea. Uh, <laughs> just the title on that one. Uh, Rick's idea, which is what we're expanding on, is is this concept of having an international patient advocacy relationship with regulatory agencies. So they have Project Orbis, which is really specific to the review process, et cetera. For advocates, it is a little bit different. Obviously, we have different sort of tiers of interest for advocates. Some people are basically family members. Other people are you know, patients in survival mode. Um, it really depends on where you come into the process, but the idea being that really we're all looking for the same kind of energy and access to making all things better for all people when it comes to cancer. So I think internationally, it does make sense to expand to do that. Yeah, and, and talking about international, uh, uh, when we were in Japan, I specifically asked to meet with a group of patients, and Angela, I don't know if you wanna comment on that. I was quite impressed. Uh, yes, yeah, so we met with a, a group of, of, of uh, patient advocates and, and, and uh, cancer survivors. Um, we needed a translator uh, due to language considerations. But uh, across these various meetings, uh, you, you realize like, there, there's a lot of commonalities, a lot of the, where the patient experience of like, the, the, the needs for and requests for greater access to, to, to therapies uh, that, uh, th that's uh, sort of a, a, a major goal for, 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 for these patients of, of having access to important therapies that, that may not be available to them. Yeah. And I thought it would be really a great idea to try to bring together the regulators and the patients from an international perspective here, because uh, we do have a lot of commonalities. And obviously, through Project Orbis, our international program, this has been a major focus of the OCE, really, to kind of bring together the regulatory, the international regulatory community. Um, yeah, but, but this is the beauty of the, the OCE, right? Like we're able to incubate and, uh -huh. and launch several of, of, of these uh, programs without much like bureaucracy and-, and Oh, and there's bureaucracy in government, I assure you. <laughs> so, uh, how to cut through this is like Dr. Pazzer's rule, don't tell anybody, just do it. And that's how we really got Project Orbis launched. Uh, uh, I'll just l l mention this story because I, I remember it quite vividly. I got on the phone and called up Canada, Australia, and uh, I think it was Singapore and said, would you be interested in doing this because uh, you have a big lag here in getting your application. So if we s ask companies to submit it at the same time, uh, would you be interested in this? I told no one about this uh, and everybody agreed to do it. And then somehow Canada called up Dr. Woodcock and in the middle of the meeting, I get this email, cryptic email, Rick, I'd like to talk to you about this program. <laughs> and I said, oh shit, okay, the, the, this is, the, 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 the shit is gonna hit the fan here. Oh, and she said, oh, this sounds really interesting. Go ahead and do it. You have my blessing. So it went on and obviously it's a su successful program. But I assure you, if I went through the standard uh, OND regulations, so to speak, we would have had 15 meetings, four, four lawyers involved with this, a guidance having to be written, which would take three years, uh, lawyers questioning which countries, how did we choose them, what applications are you looking at, how were they selected been through that multiple times and it just is one of the major problems with government and working with it that really stifles some of the innovation that I think all other people have. Um, Mitch, we were talking about patients. Uh, do you get patients calling you on the line? <laughs> we do. Um, it's, it's a hard part about having a national call center is that it is open to everybody. However, are the services that we provide and project facilitate is uniquely specific to the oncology healthcare providers and their regulatory team. So unfortunately, the services we provide may not be helpful, and it really isn't all that helpful to the individual patients, but there are other avenues for those patients to uh, speak to someone at the FDA, such as the Division of Drug Information. Um, but uh, we do have those instances, which is um, uh, fairly rare, but most of the time it's, it's very well taken, and we are able to provide them with the information they need by sending them over to the appropriate 
um, offices within the FDA. You know, I have other questions, but if you ha want to come to the microphones, I I'd really love to answer your questions because I usually know the answers to the questions I'm asking. So uh, <laughs> please feel free to come up to the microphones if you have questions regarding these programs or other OCE programs. I can't see you, so I Rick can't. Charlie see Bennett you. again. Okay. I just want to say on the um, accelerated approval, which we have on Thursday, I want to make sure the way I interpret a little bit is I want to congratulate you. The accelerated approval program for me as a patient and for me as an oncology health services researcher has really provided a lot of opportunity. And you gave the number of eight indications of not being moved forward out of the total number that Rick gave of the number of drugs going through accelerated approval. And so it seems to me that's an A plus. And I know you said there's a problem time that you had to discuss your problems. And I got the, the question I wanted to ask you in particular is because it does take some time to do confirmatory trials, there may be some point in that period of time but the trial that you're in the middle of is no longer relevant. And is there a way that you guys have an internal discussion to say, look, we've been three or four years into this, and rather than saying we have to commit to finishing this because we started it, and we're gonna whack them if they don't finish it, maybe it's time to say the, the world has changed, and maybe we shouldn't go on with this. Is that a conversation you guys have? You wanna talk things? about Doxel? Yeah, I, I think, you know, that brings up a really important uh, concept around accelerator approval. So, so you know, when we, um, kind of looking at this more broadly, when confirmatory trials are, are even completed and when they read out, you know, we, we still have to take a broad view of, uh, you know, what is the landscape at the time the confirmatory uh, trial reads out. And obviously, in some, some instances, confirmatory trial will read out with, you know, negative survival and very obvious result. But sometimes it's equivocal, and in these times when the confirmatory trial, quote unquote, fails, um, if it's if it's equivocal, we do have to consider what is the current treatment landscape. What are the available therapies at the time? Um, is it is it reasonable to remove the product from the market? What are the alternatives? And so this is this is a conversation that we do have internally, and we've been talking about this uh, quite a bit recently because our experience is kind of. Uh, informing how we can think about this more uh, more formally and kind of um, and describe it uh, in a more systematic fashion but essentially at that point when the confirmatory trial fails or if the, the readout isn't favorable again we're doing a reanalysis at that time so I, one one distinction I would make is so say say at that time when um, the scenario you described uh, we, we wouldn't then re-adjudicate the accelerated approval at the, in kind of the setting that it was first approved. We would re-adjudicate that accelerated approval at the time when we have that new information. Yep. So it really depends on what are there new drugs on the market for that, that uh, disease? Um, has, the, uh, has the treatment landscape changed? But there are a lot of I, I think also that. one of the points, Charlie, that is very important is that's why we're emphasizing that these trials should be substantially enrolled before we uh, really grant the accelerated approval. We really want to have well-defined timelines about what, when the trial is going to read out, okay? Because uh, things can change, okay? Uh, but I think the issue and the clinical meaningfulness of a trial is to have it as close as possible to read out to uh, the granting of accelerated approval. Here again, I think with the, it, it's about three years the difference now between the accelerated approval and the completion of the clinical confirmatory yeah, trial, exactly. which is fine, okay? But there are some bad actors, so to speak, uh, that don't start their clinical trials, and that leads us to a quandary of problems. Number one, can the confirmatory trial even be done, okay? Number two, do you need to do a dose study looking, especially if you're going to be using the new drug with in combination therapies? So that needs to be done before the accelerated approval should be granted. Uh, and number three, what would be the impact of the approval of the drug on the confirmatory trial, the accelerated approval on the confirmatory trial? So our big emphasis is come in, let's, let's look at the 
a confirmatory trial and the accelerated approval as a package, okay, a comprehensive drug development package. And before you begin any patient on any trial, okay, let's talk about what the accelerated approval study is going to be, what the confirmatory trial is going to be, when they're going to be initiated. Uh, the days of doing a single arm trial of 100 patients with X response rate and saying, well, we'll get to the confirmatory trial someday, those days are over. Okay, I want to make sure people understand this. This is going to be a period, perhaps if you want to test the FDA on this, is going to be a period, uh, I will quote myself, tough love, okay. Uh, and this is going to require some support of the community. We may have an application that has demonstrated safety and efficacy, but will we approve the drug if the confirmatory trial is not underway? And the answer to that is no, okay. So we are going to have to have the support of the community. That's the intent of the legislation. Uh, and uh, I have the support of all of the leadership at the FDA on this point of view. Obviously, there can be some areas of flexibility that we will have, but the general approach of we're not starting the trial until we get the accelerated approval, that ain't happening anymore. We want to have these early discussions. What's the confirmatory trial? What's the accelerated approval? And we could actually work with you on that with the numbers of patients that you might need for accelerated approval. Earlier looks at randomized trials could give us additional information at the time of the accelerated approval. Remember, when we're dealing with a single arm trial, which many of these accelerated approvals are given on, when we, it, it, these single arm, large single arm trials really uh, are an abomination of drug development. They never occurred before the accelerated approval program. Most tr traditional drug development was to do a small single arm trial and then when activity was demonstrated, you would go on to do a randomized study. Well, these large single arm trials of 100 patients or so <clears throat> are only being done for accelerated approval. They give us very little information and only give us a greater degree of certainty around what a response rate would be. Very little additional information on safety since there's no comparator and certainly no information on overall survival and progression-free survival. So I, I think, you know, as with time, and uh, if you want to give the numbers of, uh, of accelerated approvals, we, we've given most of these in oncology. So it's yeah, like yeah, I, I, I think it's 187 accelerated approvals in oncology, and that's, it's over uh, two-thirds of all the accelerated approvals have been granted by FDA. And actually, the percentage of the accelerated approvals that are being granted in oncology as a total of the whole accelerated approvals granted by FDA is increasing with every decade. Um, so we're, we're at like 80% in the, in the most recent decade. And, and not, not to harp on this issue, but when we take a look at our databases uh, and just go to project con confirm here, the problems that we've had with accelerated approval all center around these studies that have not initiated their trials at the time of accelerated approval. So uh, that's why we were really adamant and really s very supportive of the congressional action and the language there uh, giving us the authority of having these trials ongoing at the time of accelerated approval. Okay, next question. Hi there. Um, my question has to do with numbers too. So it's Quincy, Quincy Chow from Menarini. So my question is I read it for Dr. Chan, and I think uh, your project's facilitate is a godsend because of the expand access paperwork nightmare that for people who have done it, you know, uh, something that is, is very stressful and under the pressure, you gotta turn around. So can you share with us your volume of work? That is how many actually you, re you receive and I know that you said 24 hours is hard to believe, but uh, I'll take your word for it. Can you share with us? Thank you. No, that's a very good question because, uh, you know, through the years we've seen that increase, and what does that increase really look like? So since our launch, we've seen an increase anywhere between 30 to 45% increase every year 
in applications we received. So I'm talking about is, you know, back before Project Facilitate, we were seeing numbers around maybe around 500 or so. Just between October 31st of 2022 and October 31st of this year, we saw almost 1,000 applications submitted to Project Facilitate alone. And that's not including anywhere else within the FDA, any other centers, and that's just with Project Facilitate. Now, when we're talking about also, because uh, you know, we, we at Project Facilitate, not only do we take phone calls, but we get emailed. And e we also accept emailed applications to try to make it easier for the public. And so we are seeing majority, almost 90% of all of our applications are being received through email because it's so easy just to attach your forms, your documents on there, email it to us, get immediate feedback. And uh, so in the past year, between October to October, almost 1,000 applications. It's been one of the highest amounts we've had. Just uh, one more. What do you do day in and day out? <laughs> <laughs> so that's also a very good question. So um, our, our usual workflow uh, within Project Facilitate is uh, we, we have like an operational team every single day that logs onto a call center and we take that, those calls that come in from all around the nation in our territories. And uh, you know, these are regulatory questions, sometimes these are emergency applications that come in where the physician has very little time, they, don't, they can't fill out the, the, you know, the forms and get everything to us immediately. And so that takes up a substantial portion of our workflow as well. And then every other part of our day is, is receiving those applications in and reviewing them and getting feedback from our teammates from the other clinical divisions um, and then informing the providers uh, that they're safe to proceed with their, their treatment. In addition to all of that, if that wasn't enough, we also are doing follow-ups. So when there's annual reports being submitted to that application every year, we actually look at that, we review it, we ensure you know, what, what kind of adverse events did that patient suffer from in the past year? Um, what, what kind of protocol amendments have gone through? How is the patient currently? Is it a stable disease? Is it partial? Um, and so you know, these are all questions we ask when, when every single patient's application um, not just when we receive it, but you know, maintenance-wise, all throughout the years when we could receive those annual reports. But um, hopefully that answers your question, but. <laughs> Next question. Ishwar Isabaya with Sarah Cannon and US Oncology. I mean, thank you for the work that you're doing. I think each acronymed entity really resonates with those of us who are working to mitigate barriers to access to trials. Uh, one area that um, can't help but be curious about is, is your real world experience with the FDA diversity plan. Uh, how, has, how has the implementation of that plan, what are changes and uh, what have you noticed since, since that uh, requirement slash strong recommendation went into effect? <laughs> Well, that, that's an evolving area at, at, at the FDA, and stay tuned. We're having more workshops on that area and having greater discussion of the, uh, of the diversity plan, so stay tuned to that. Uh, but I, I just want to make sure that people understand, and here again, this is where many of these projects interdigitate together, so to speak. When we talk about diversity, I think one of the most important things that we realize although this is usually a discussion that we have here in the United States, that true diversity, for us to recognize this in the United States, we have to look at this as an international pro problem also, or an international challenge. Uh, and this could actually give us more information. We also have to ask ourselves, why are we asking for diversity, and there are many reasons. One is a social justice issue, which is very important. There's been a tremendous decrease in the confidence that people have in the medical system, and having patients that really uh, participate in clinical trials build that confidence up. There's a in, a extrinsic uh, ethnic issue of how the medical system, especially for those that are disadvantaged, impacts healthcare delivery and healthcare uh, data. And then there's also intrinsic differences of the potential uh, racial, uh, racial and ethnic differences that may affect 
for example, drug metabolism. One of the things that we're advocating for, obviously, are international trials in addition to U.S. trials. Uh, the international trials hopefully will enroll more patients and centers in Central America and Africa, which may give us greater information on those ethnic minorities also in the United States, particularly with regard to intrinsic differences. But stay tuned for the uh, diversity plans. That's coming up soon. Okay, any other questions? Because I think our time is up. Uh -huh. So thank you, it was a really excellent panel. I wanna know what's next. <laughs> what are you thinking? What's next? I don't know. Um, I'd have to think about that because usually these projects come to me spontaneously. Uh, I happen, I do, for those of you that live in Bethesda, you might see me walking around. I do a lot of walking and hiking and usually these ideas come to me. But usually they come from problems that we see, okay? Uh, uh, Mitch's program began basically because, you know, this this whole expanded access thing was a mess as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the project confirmed basically uh, was an issue. We needed a website. We kept on getting calls from the press. How many accelerated approvals were granted in this year? How many confirmatory studies are this? How many confirmatory studies had this endpoint, that endpoint? And it was like, we can't do this and drop everything. So we started Project Confirmed. Jeff's program obviously is important because uh, we really need to address people that need access and help from us that don't have established regulatory departments. And obviously, RIA's program is one that we're, we were always interested in because my belief, not having lived my life in the Beltway here, but outside of the Beltway, that the agency is focused on the East Coast and most of our development programs and programs are all between Boston and Duke. You could draw a straight line here. And we really need to get out into the community, especially those people that are underserved. Jeff, you wanted well, to say something? Do you want something? to plug the PPP for NCI and in FNIH, the, the ultra-rare cancer tumor uh -huh. PPP? If you want to plug that. Okay, it's That's plugged. Next. <laughs> we're out of time. <laughs> There's only so many programs I could give. <laughs> but here again, they, they stem from the program, the problems that we see. And one of the things that I always emphasize to the staff is if you see, I think one of the problems, that if, and in fact, it came up in my trip to Japan. You don't want to see yourself as a victim of the system, okay? What are the things that you could change? And sometimes a small change could have a big impact, okay? The call center, for example. Uh, just small things could have a, a, a big difference. So take a look at the problems that you're facing and then how do you get around it rather than, I'm working in this bureaucracy and there's absolutely nothing that I can do about it. And if you leave with that intent of there's nothing I could do about it, it just leads to a disillusioned workforce, basically, that uh, feel just trapped by a bureaucratic system. So, you know, my biggest issue for the FDA is reduction in bureaucracy. Uh, and I think that's really an important goal that we try to look at. We will never get enough people, okay? We have to take a look at how we can work more efficiently and how to multitask people uh, to make their lives more interesting also. Because I think all of us would agree, most of the people here uh, do review work uh, and do projects also, okay? So they have dual functions, many of them. So it's how to make their, their jobs more interesting and to fit their goals with the goals of the OCE. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you all. Thank you. Th thank you very much, um, Dr. Pazder, for your time being here today um, and to the continued innovation and ingenuity that you and your team show. And thanks to all of the, participa all of the participants in this discussion. Congratulations on the progress that you've made through these uh, big difference projects. Um, I'll now invite our last session of panelists uh, to come on up on the stage here. 
Uh, this last session, uh, we'll be discussing maximizing use of data from academic-led studies for regulatory decision-making. Uh, again, this group has been meeting for the, uh, for the last couple of months. Um, I would encourage you to read their paper uh, through the QR link on the summary today um, and look forward to their discussion, which will be moderated by Kathleen Winson. So I'll hand things over to you, Kathy. Thank you. Let me find my seat. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, as Jeff said, my name is Kathy Winson. I am an executive group director at Genentech Roche, and I am really excited to be moderating this panel today. Um, I've actually been partnering with, I work in industry, but I've been working in partnerships with academic groups for the better part of 20 years, and so I'm a, a very strong advocate of the value of this data. So I'm really excited that we're starting to talk about um, really dig into how to optimize um, these partnerships. And so, because I noticed there was a lot of um, engagement from the audience, I'm gonna jump right in to some of the, some of the questions, um, get the panel, but before I start, I'm just gonna introduce our panel. Um, next to me on my left is Christina Laumann. Um, she's a program manager at Alliance for Clinical Trials and Oncology Statistics and Data Management, um, located at the Mayo Clinic. And next to Christina is Meg Mooney. This is her second panel for, <laughs> for the day. Um, Meg is Associate Director for Center of Therapeutic Evaluation Program in the Division of Cancer Treatment and Diagnostic at NCI. So we're gonna get a, an NCI perspective on these discussions, which is helpful. And then next to her um, from FDA, we have Christy Osgood. She's the Acting Supervisor, Associate Director in the Division of Oncology One. And we've got an industry perspective down um, from Russ. Uh, this is Russ Palmer, who is a director of operations um, in the uh, global development operations at, sorry, I had a lot of <laughs> <laughs> at EMD Serrano. Sorry about that, Russ. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, and then uh, finally, at the far end, we have um, Sunita Zalani. And Sunita is the vice president and TA head for oncology um, and in vitro diagnostics in global regulatory affairs and, and clinical safety at Merck. Now you know why I need a cheat sheet for these titles. <laughs> so let's go ahead and um, start. Um, and we're just talking about uh, the benefits, really, before we, the, way we, the way we structured our um, working group is I think initially there was just really general agreement that there are huge benefits to ac academic drug development, both in clinical research and in drug development, and certainly a role in both. Um, so there wasn't a lot of discussion about, you know, is this valuable or not? We jumped right into, yes, this is valuable. But then we segued into, here's the challenges. So we spent the first couple of weeks in our working group really kind of trying to figure out what these challenges are, how do we parse those out, and what are things that are actionable. So we're going to um, structure the discussion today just really starting with the, talking about the value of it first, um, just sharing that with the broader audience. And then we're going to spend just maybe 10 minutes or so talking about the challenge, the specific challenges, because that really set us up for some of the recommendations, some of the strategies that we're proposing to really get some traction and really in, improve and optimize the way we use this data. So um, starting with the benefits of academic drug development, I'm gonna ask um, Russ and Meg to weigh in on this. Um, Russ, maybe from an industry perspective, can you talk a little bit about the role of academic drug development? What are, what are some of the, um, what is the value from an industry perspective of this data? Uh, certainly. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the uh, Friends of Cancer Research for giving me the opportunity to be here today and to uh, be part of the panel discussion. Um, some of the benefits, of course, are obvious. Um, if it, we're talking registration, uh, which is what we're gathering here from the white paper, uh, it's a win-win situation for pharma. Um, however, there are other opportunities to expand our uh, science-based knowledge on the molecule itself. Uh, it also benefits the collaborations that we have in order, uh, additional exposure to key opinion leaders. Um, and work within our own company with medical information as well as uh, supporting just obviously trying to get patients, uh, drugs to patients in a much more quicker fashion as possible. Where it fits in within uh, our portfolio, it depends. Um, and that is, uh, we have our own clinical development plan target product profile. And of course, uh, when we are presented with a proposal, um, we start to think about, okay, does this expand the indication? What value does this bring to the organization? Um, is it worth pursuing? And also, uh, does it answer some of the other scientific questions that we don't yet know? Yeah. Thanks, Russ. 
And I think in the um, white paper, we also outlined a number of areas, emerging areas, where we think this data would be valuable, such as um, focusing on diversity. And we've, we've also, in the last panel, we're talking about more pragmatic trials. So really, um, it aligns with a lot of the OCE efforts. We see some of the um, academic drug developments partner well with some of those efforts. Um, Meg, maybe from an NCI perspective, um, talk about some of the, your perspective uh, around the value of these um, trials. Well, when, when there is a, a collaboration where it looks like that there's a mutual benefit um, to the collaboration with, with the company, we find it particularly valuable because obviously part of our research effort at the NCI is not just to develop drugs, but to, along the entire continuum when we have a late phase clinical trial to hopefully have them lead uh, to indications that would benefit everyone in the United States. So in that sense, it certainly is a win-win proposition. Um, and so. Uh, we're very interested when there can be a collaboration that can be worked out. Obviously, we do a lot of trials that are, are not for registrational intent as well, because there are a lot of other questions, you know, such as we discussed this morning, dose, different doses, um, different schedules, different sequencing, length of treatment, that often are, are not obviously a primary focus for a, a primary indication or a secondary indication. So. Um, I think when it can work out, it benefits everyone, and particularly it benefits uh, the patients and, and everyone, just not in the United States, but also internationally as well. All right. Thank you, Meg. So we're going to shift now and just for a few minutes talk about some of the challenges that we identified in our um, discussions in preparation for the white paper. Um, we, one of the initial challenges that we identified was this, this um, ambiguity around the, the intent of the data and the fact that sometimes sponsors are not completely clear. I'm talking about industry sponsors. <laughs> not, industry sponsors <laughs> are not always completely clear about the intent of the study. And we may go in and say, oh, no, it's just for publication and, and then show up at the back end <laughs> trying to file it. Um, so we did identify that as sort of a, a major hurdle. Um, and, and maybe, Russ, you can just talk from a, an industry standpoint, maybe some of the reasons why that's not always clear, some of the reasons why we don't come in very clearly stating that the, the intent of the data. It, it's a little bit about, um, again, where it fits within our clinical development portfolio. Um, and is it a strategic fit at the time uh, of, the, of the first introduction of the idea? Um, over time, um, you know, Either A, we determine, you know, is it a pathway to registration, or B, uh, is it for an expansion of scientific knowledge? As you mentioned earlier, diversity of populations, different indications, uh, different dose regimens, and so forth, which is a value, but, you know, it may not be at the inflection point that we're going to make that decision, so that's the challenge for us. Um, and additionally, at the, uh, at the end of all this, we, we understand the value of supporting these studies because, you know, our portfolios, you know, money is finite. Uh, we have our existing program that we have to kind of fund. And this may or may not fit in the paradigm of what we're trying to achieve just yet. But once we know the answers, the problem is, is that, of course, as, we, as the white paper is going to suggest today, is like, how do we get, collect the data in the manner that we need? Uh, and in doing so in the beginning is very beneficial to obviously both of us. Thanks. So it's not always simply we just can't make up our mind. There's a that's pretty much, yeah, <laughs> I know that's the long way around. I, I know it seems like that to our NCI colleagues that we just <laughs> flop Good idea, we don't know, yes. Registrational, no, <laughs> publication, registrational, publication. Exactly. Um, yeah, but it's important, it's important, and we identified this as something really important because um, next I'm going to go to Megan and ask her to talk about the impact of uh, the wishy-washiness <laughs> um, when we're not very clear about uh, the intended use of the data and, and what impact this has on NCI in terms of how we proceed. Well, um, given that we get our funding from the, the tax or U.S. Tax, taxpayers and, and we're government uh, funded, we don't have probably the depth of um, funding um, to probably run every uh, trial for potential registration intent. So um, that's number one. But number two, you know, we do run and use our funding to do a lot of trials that are not never going to go for a registrational intent. So because of that, our systems aren't geared up to just turn out registrational intent um, data collection on every single trial. So uh, that's why we start very early for every phase three trial that's proposed, every phase two, three trial that's proposed, um, and occasionally on a randomized phase two trial if it's in a very rare uh, 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 cancer, 
we try to talk directly to the company and to the groups and investigators leading that trial to try to get those questions answered and, and where they are. And I think going forward, when the answer is yes, it's pretty clear what the path forward is and what we have to do. When it's sort of in the middle and occasionally someone will tell us, well, we'd like it to be registration light. And so we don't really have that category per se. But um, we've talked more and more about maybe components that we could add to something that um, may potentially have registrational intent, but it's not going to be designed full force from the beginning. Um, but what happens essentially if it comes at the end, like no one really expected to use it for registration, it had uh, overwhelming benefit of whatever the primary endpoint was, and it was thought to be potentially registration uh, worthy of an indication, to go back and collect some of the data that you would have collected had you known from the beginning can be very, very difficult. Um, just collecting scans, even though we run our trials um, in the United States where we have sophisticated medical care, um, but across nationally, across all types of uh, sites, very difficult to go back after the fact and collect everything. Much easier, and we do do this in some registration light and some, mm -hmm. some other trials, um, we may collect the scans with an uh, eye towards eventually using it as a sensitivity analysis for progression-free survival, but use investigator um, uh, assessment of PFS as the primary endpoint. Um, so we try to mix and match those kinds of things. But it, I think the biggest thing is going back, the burden on the sites to try to collect something that's easy to collect as you're, as you're seeing the patient in clinic, as they're having their scans done, as you're uh, talking with them, to try to go back and get some of that information um, is very difficult. We have done it in, in a couple of situations, but it's, it's timely, it's slow, and, and, and for obvious reasons. I think anytime you change your mind on anything in life, <laughs> <laughs> there are consequences. Certainly. Okay, and, and thank you. And, and I think um, one of the things that we talked about as part of the um, working group is these long um, data cleaning timelines, and that's exactly what's contributing to that. This, this indecision up front is what contributes then to a year-long process of cleaning the data, and it's, it's very disappointing because, you know, when we see really good results, we don't want to spend a year fixing sure. the data to get that, those therapies to patients. So in moving on to, um, we also identified the fact that even when we do clearly identify these trials as registrational, and we're very good about going in and having the right discussions, there's, there are still some challenges. There are still some inherent challenges to um, academic research. And a lot of the things we um, talked about were around the differences in um, the database or the data structures and the data processes. Um, so the, uh, I'm gonna name just a couple of these. Um, we, we identified um, some challenges um, including differences in the database capture, differences in um, review, and then um, differences in how access or lack of access to data. Um, Christina, so maybe we start with the first one of these. Um, can you talk a little bit about the differences in how data are captured and monitored in academic trials? So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And I think Meg started to hit on some of this. <laughs> you know, we're. Uh, speaking specifically from the Alliance, we run a large number of trials. Most don't have registration intent, and it's run in a pretty limited funding mechanism. And so we, in sort of a survival mode, actually create a lot of homegrown standards and infrastructure with support of NCI systems that are ultimately geared towards our primary purpose of the data, which is an academic publication. We don't submit, and I like, likely will never submit to the regulatory agencies. So our infrastructure just isn't set up that way. And we're making progress to try to move that way by following C standards for data collection, but there's always going to be fundamental differences, I think, in what we collect, just given that different intent. And some key areas that often trip up industry partners is around AE and safety data, kind of a really important piece. And so it's not uncommon to not have verbatim terms. We don't collect start and stop dates. We don't code to standard medical terminology like MEDRA or WHO drug because we don't even collect CONMEDs. We don't collect medical history logs. We rarely capture all of the planned labs and we never capture unplanned labs in most of our trials. In addition, we don't do a lot of the routine standard activities like you mentioned, like on-site monitoring or site PI signatures. This is extra data collection that doesn't typically have utility for our purpose and it's not a requirement to submit a journal to have on-site monitoring, so it just doesn't happen for us. And it's not in trying to be difficult or, or you know, 
hard to work with. It's just a product of what we use the data for, which is very different from a regulatory submission. Thanks, Christina. Um, in addition to the differences um, in the data capture, um, Sunita, maybe you can talk to some of the challenges that we identified around the, some of those issues, but also around um, the data transfer, not having access to the data um, in, during the conduct of the trial. Maybe touch on a couple of those challenges. Yes. So first of all, I would like to thank FOCR for convening this panel and all the panelists for your insights. Um, we have a, an excellent partnership with NCI, NCT, and Network, and we, along with our alliance partners, have at least embarked upon eight studies over the past few years. Many were registration intent and led to label indications. Um, based on those studies and our experience, there are a couple challenges I'd like to highlight. The, the first is that the data, as mentioned already, that the data provided to us by the NCI, NCT, and network is not, uh, does not meet the FDA standards for submission. So the industry partner has to spend about, you know, at least in our experience, eight to 12 months to map, uh, query, um, uh, uh, clean the data, and, and then make it suitable for submission, which is the SDTM and ADAM standards for FDA. The second challenge is that, um, you know, it, there appears to be that uh, the NCI and CTN policy is restrictive, and we can only, the industry sponsor can only get data from 30 patients in, in many instances during the conduct of the study. So as a result, the data comes at the end, and we end up spending eight to 12 months with many programmers and statisticians deployed to do the work. Lastly, I'd like to mention that industry, if it was an industry-sponsored trial, we would typically submit in three to four months compared to the eight to 12 months for cooperative group studies, and we would be cleaning data on a real-time basis. Thank you, Sunita. And then just to wrap up the discussion on the challenges, um, Christy's been listening to all of the challenges <laughs> that we identified, and, and it would be great to get an FDA perspective. One of the things we, we also talked about that we haven't mentioned yet is this, this um, ambiguity around um, the intent of the data. The downstream impact of that is that oftentimes we are not going and talking to the health authorities practically about these study designs, and, and because if we don't, if we're not clear about the intent of the data, you know, these trials get started. So we, we do, we did identify this lack of uh, proactive health authority engagement as an issue, but then you've heard some of the other um, challenges that we've said. Maybe talk a little bit about how this impacts uh, FDA when, when we're showing up with this data, mid-trial, end of the trial, um, what are some of the challenges there? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, and I also want to thank you from the, my two other colleagues that were on the white paper with us at the FDA. Um, we, you know, I think there's challenges, um, different challenges depending on when, you know, we finally hear that there is this either looking promising study or, um, oh, a study that's read out and it's very positive. And I think we see a lot of different challenges with that. I think the first thing that I want to make sure that everybody knows is that we need data that we can evaluate for our, a risk-benefit assessment in order to take a regulatory action. That's not just for FDA, that's also for any foreign regulators that, um, regular agencies that you may also be submitting to. Um, and so we need that data to be in a, in a way that we can review it, um, and it needs to have enough information for us to make um, a risk-benefit decision on it if you're planning to submit it for regulatory um, purposes. I would say if we're hearing about it at the very end, um, sometimes what we find is that the trial wasn't actually adequately designed for registration purpose. We completely understand that when you're initially designing a trial for an academic um, exercise or to publish a paper or to answer a question like dose optimization, but suddenly you're seeing these results, it may not have the appropriate endpoint given the disease that you're looking at. It may not have the appropriate alpha control or sample size for us to be able to consider it for regulatory purposes. So, so those are some of the challenges we see when the trial has been completely designed outside of being considered for regulatory purposes. Um, as far as um, what we see from a safety perspective is that a lot of times there just isn't um, adequate information collected for us to make a safety, like a risk determination. Um, because for 
publication and other academic purposes, you wouldn't need all of that information. So we completely understand it, but we still need it for our purposes. Um, I think that all of this is actually very context dependent though. I think it's really important that you have to consider both um, the context of the, the disease that you're studying, you know, is it late line, something without a lot of options, um, and as well as the context of the drug itself. Is it, is it a drug with 18 other indications? So maybe we don't need as much safety information because we know the drug's um, safety profile. So I think all of these things are really important to be discussed with FDA at whatever point in time you decide that this trial could be serving for regulatory purposes. But we need to talk about the statistical design, the efficacy endpoints, the disease setting, comparator arms, and all of those sorts of things. Um, so that's sort of what we need to be provided with and we'll provide you with. We can try to provide flexibility um, once you come and talk to us with some of this stuff. And I know that we'll discuss later sort of the flexibility about the kind of data that's actually submitted. But when you're submitting things like legacy data or data that isn't as clean, it takes us longer to review. We're, we're just like the NCI, we're not staffed with hundreds of statisticians to dig through data or hundreds of medical officers. We have one statistician, one medical officer who's digging through all this data. So the higher quality data you can submit to us, the easier it is for us to review and actually make that risk benefit decision. I think, Christy, it's important for us to understand the implications <laughs> for, for some of these um, decisions we make. So for the remaining part of the discussion, we're going we're gonna to now um, pivot and talk to uh, some of the recommendations, some of the strategies that, that we developed as part of the white paper. And these obviously are coming from the issues that we noted. Um, let's talk about the first, and these are roughly divided into um, the beginning of the study, what are the things you want to do, we want to do a little differently at the beginning of the study? What are some things we can do during the conduct of the study that would help? And then what are some, uh, some ideas that we can do that might help um, accelerate the um, getting the data to the FDA and, and getting the, um, these studies approved? So let's start with the, at the front end of the study. Um, one of the suggestions we proposed was establishing more of a, a set set of process, a set of processes um, for studies that we identify. And this is presuming that um, industry can identify these as <laughs> registrational. So that's the first step. Um, but once these are identified as registrational, we we talked about in what we call the regulatory tract, establishing a more um, standard regulatory track that has a set of processes. Um, I'm going to have Christina and Meg talk about this from a couple of different perspectives. Um, maybe to start with Meg, talk about from a high level, you, you've already touched on this when you talked about how you treat, uh, when you know the registrational, how you treat them differently. Maybe if you can expand on what that might look like, what are some areas that we could really hone in on and, and improve, and then we'll go to Christy and talk about what the impact might be on the ground if we were, if we had like a regulatory track. I'll start with Meg. So we have made uh, some improvements in our systems overall. Um, we have a common data management system that is professional grade to collect data. Um, that being said, um, we need to know what data really needs to be collected. And so, as I said, um, as part of a standard process now, we do um, ask and make sure whether it's going to be under um, NCI sponsorship, uh, under our IND, or it's going to be under the group's IND for a definitive phase three or phase two, three. Um, study whether the company um, partner and collaborator is interested in registrational intent. And if the answer is yes, or even maybe yes, um, we actually put forward that we should go to the FDA right away, right after we've um, sort of approved the general concept, and set forward those questions that the company would want to ask specifically about the, re you know, the registration intent. The, what data they need, and we also put in questions where we think <laughs> pragmatic elements, particularly if it's a, a drug that we know uh, has a good safety profile, what we, uh, and also the clinical setting, what type of information you know, really is important to collect, can we not collect certain elements because we know so much about the drug, either safety or, or, or about um, the particular clinical setting and patient population. So that is a part of our standard process. And I think that that, that is key because that begins the discussion, um, knowing what the FDA would be ex expecting. Um, then we can have further discussions and, and um, the data centers and Christina and her colleagues can talk about what, what they need. We also have done a couple things to make sure you know, um, that we're a little bit more compliant with registrational intent type uh, activities where we do have CDSC-DASH and we do 
Um, we have upgraded um, other elements of our, our data collection center. We now have integrated routine and expedited AEs. They used to be in different databases, very hard to reconcile. However, that only started more recently with trials activated in 2019 or beyond, and we had someone that, some that were midway, so they're not taking advantage of that. Um, but in any case, that's sort of the first step. I would, and, and from there, everything else I think can be discussed. If it comes in more midpoint, um, as <laughs> was alluded to, um, we, we then actually do also go to the FDA um, to say the company partner has now identified this. And, and we say, well, unfortunately, <laughs> the trial has started, <laughs> and this is what we've been collecting. But sometimes, if it's early on, we can make adjustments. Sometimes, you know, we go back and we do collect uh, data and with support of the company sponsor to try to address those issues. Um, we're trying, as, as Selena mentioned, to focus now more on the data transfer and what we can do to alleviate that in the time period, particularly when we know it's registrational intent. Um, so everywhere along the, the, the path, we've, with the experience we've developed over the last decade, we're trying to define those areas and how best to do this. But it starts with upfront, just asking the basic question, having a thorough discussion, because at least if we know that, we can start on the right foot for those trials. Something happens later, well, over time we're developing different ways to intervene as, uh, in that way as well, because we do have a lot of confidence in the data we collect. I know that it's, it's not always you know, as pristine or as easy to, to evaluate, but we do have a lot of confidence in it. Um, we have a national network that's been in operation for decades with sites, and we have a lot of confidence at that level. And we have very um, uh, a national central IRB that reviews all, all the consents. And so we have a lot of elements that are sort of a standing part of the infrastructure that if we were maybe just a small company going out, we, you know, we would have to arrange all those things. So in any case, all of that is to say that we're constantly working on this. But we do have a developed process if we know right up front. Mm -hmm. and I'll let Christine uh, you know, expand on that. I think from a for just from a um, you work at this from a different yeah. angle. So um, developing a regular and it sounds like we have the framework and a lot of things in place for a regulatory track. There may be some areas of focus to in, continue to improve that. To your point, Meg, and and talk a little bit about what you see as a kind of important elements of this regulatory track. From <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think it starts with the NCI and the FDA conversations, and then it kind of gets passed to the group that's running the trial. And, and that's where it's really important that we have that early commitment, because if we have that with the proper support, we can implement a lot of the things that are missing. Maybe not at the exact same way industry would do it, but within the confines of our, of our infrastructure. Um, with keeping you know, all of the things we've talked about today, limiting data collection when it's appropriate, and. You know, so if, if we know we have and will continue to add data collection, and even though I, I hate agreeing to it, if ConMeds are needed, we'll collect them because it's necessary. Um, you know, we'll, we'll implement on-site monitoring and quality management plans to meet that, you know, that extra layer of activity. We can, even though our sites hate this, we can do site PI signatures, we can do data lock procedures, we can do it all meeting in the middle, we can do it all, but we just need to know up front so that we have that support to staff up to treat these trials with the prioritization they need. Otherwise, they become just a standard study that doesn't get all of the extras. And I think in addition to that commitment, I think we've learned a lot at the Alliance over the last several years that you need active engagement. You can't just say up front, I'm, yep, I'm in, and then disappear until the data reads out. You have to stay engaged with us so that we can be proactive, whether it's changes in the clinical trial landscape or changes in what you're learning as, as an industry sponsor about submissions. If we can keep those discussions ongoing on a routine basis, we can adjust on the fly to hopefully you know, mitigate some of those timelines at the end rather than just waiting till, oh, the data read out, okay, well now we need to change these 20 things that we've learned in the last five years. Thanks. So, so what I'm hearing is it's not so much about the having set processes. A lot of it's really about this fundamentals of first identifying, figuring out what you need to talk about, and engaging, and really continuing the dialogue. So even if you had processes, if we lose those other elements, having a regulatory track and the right processes aren't enough. We need, we need that engagement, so. 
Um, so moving on to uh, the data sharing we mentioned as one of the issues, um, we talked a lot about this, um, the data sharing policies and the limited access to data. Sunita, can you talk a little bit more about some of the strategies that we outlined in the white paper and the importance of finding that balance between maintaining the data integrity but also getting, getting um, more access to the data? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to use a real example of uh, energy GY over eight study in endometrial cancer. Um, you know, uh, NCI, um, NC, NRG presented uh, this excellent data uh, earlier this year for patients with endometrial cancer. And I think reflecting back uh, as we are preparing this filing for submission, reflecting back, there are a couple things that perhaps we can implement for future trials. One is to establish secure blinded data transfer through the conduct of the study so that uh, you know it's not 30 patients of data and it all doesn't come at the end and then there are surprises. The second is leveraging third party organizations and we from industry are happy to support that. If the data cannot be transferred to us, can it be transferred to a third party who can be mapping and cleaning this real time uh, as we would do for our trials that would still maintain data integrity. Thank you. And then we also talked about, um, oh, sorry, Christine, <laughs> I just pointed, I'm gonna ask you this question. So now I'm gonna ask you this question. Um, any, anything, you want, anything you wanna add from yeah. your perspective? I think we need to have I think we need to have conversations with the NCI and the NCTN groups and, and industry to really understand and find compromise because I, I think it's unrealistic to say, here's all the data, like we're just gonna hand it over before it's released. But I, rec I can recognize that maybe 30 patients is a little <laughs> too small of a subset. But I also think there's a lot of opportunity in even some of the data cleaning aspects. You know, things might be easier with data, but there's no reason why we don't today. And as I was preparing this, I'm like, why, not, why aren't I suggesting this? Why don't we sit down with our stats and data management colleagues from both Alliance and industry and talk about how are you gonna clean the data at the end? And if we knew that, even without data, we can implement those same checks now, which ultimately will help get that data cleaner faster. So I think it's, it's recognizing we need to find compromise with the policies and the data sharing, but also exploring other solutions without data to kind of take a holistic approach at this and attack it from all angles so that we can ultimately reduce those timelines. Right. And then moving quickly on to, we talked about some mechanisms for streamlining the data submission. So again, talking about you know, how do we speed up from data readout and we see these great data but you know, how, how can we improve upon those 12 month timelines as on average 12 month timelines? Um, you know, we, we talked about um, leveraging some of the elements from real, um, real time oncology review and looking at that as sort of a model and how do you adapt that? Um, so maybe Sunita, talk, talk a little bit about some of the ideas that we discussed um, for streamlining the data. Yes. And then I actually want to use a, an, an example of Lung Pragmatica. You know, there was a lot of excitement and discussion about Lung Pragmatica, and we are certainly interested in pursuing additional pragmatic studies. Um, and so what I want to clarify is less data collection does not mean faster submission. Even if Lung Pragmatica results, um, when they read out, and if they are positive, it would still take us eight to 12 months. And so we've been thinking about applying some of the things we discussed in our work streams about how we could expedite this process because the study has just initiated. So the first has been you know, conversations with FDA and CTEP on um, submission requirements after the protocol uh, design was agreed upon. But now we are having conversations on protocol, uh, you know, on, on uh, submission requirements. Um, is there any flexibility by FDA? We understand there is not, <laughs> but we, we broached the question. We, we know it's a difficult question. Um, is there, uh, uh, how can we collaborate to make sure that there are no surprises? For example, there's a safety update requirement. The safety terms are mapping to the appropriate time, appropriate uh, terms. So I think those close collaboration and discussions between the three parties must need to happen to make 
uh, these treatments available quickly to patients once the data reads out positive. And then Christy, maybe weigh in on this yeah. question as well. It would be, here, be great to hear FDA's yeah. perspective on this. Absolutely. I can't, um, I can't comment on any specific um, trials. <laughs> um, but what I, but I, will, what I will say is that FDA absolutely does support the use of academic data, different trial designs, different submission methods in order to try to get some of this academic data, this cooperative group data to be reviewed because we do feel like it's very important um, as part of the um, you know, representation of the American public in, in clinical trials and, and getting drugs out to people in, a, in the most expeditious, but also safe. So again, we go back to the fact that we still need the data to review and we need it in a way that we can review it um, easily. And, you know, that also allows us to take advantage of reviewing it in a timely fashion as well. You know, we have all of our deadlines, but we also try to review things um, as timely and as expeditious as we can. So the higher quality data that we get, the, the easier that is for us. So I think that although we're willing to have as much flexibility as we possibly can with some of this stuff, and we're absolutely willing to meet not only with um, the industry partners, but also the academic and cooperative group partners in order to figure out where we can see flexibilities, where we can talk about submission timelines and things like that. It has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis because it is, as I said, it's very important to understand the context of the disease, the drug that's being studied, the treatment landscape, what else has come out with a new safety update mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, so I think all of those things are just super important to keep lots of open communication, not only between the industry partners and the alliance, but also with the FDA, because we are willing to give you flexibility, but we have to have you know specific things that we can comment on and provide flexibility for. And the earlier um, that that happens, the easier it is for us to be flexible because we've you know, had a longer time to sort of figure out what you're doing and help give more advice, so. All right, thank you. And so we have about four more minutes left for this question, so everybody's gonna have to do a rapid fire response. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna allow some time for um, some audience questions. Um, just moving forward and thinking about our, our future state, um, what are some of the either, it doesn't have to be long-term, it could be even near-term uh, wins or long-term vision? Um, what does success look like for you? So just pick any one of those three questions <laughs> to address. Chris? Oh yeah, sorry, okay. I'm gonna go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think success to me is, is developing long-term partnerships between all of the parties involved to, to find the right balance and, and with the compromise and, and recognize that we need to do more to meet the regulatory requirements for, for those submissions while keeping the spirit and, and the heart of these trials in the academic setting and the academic and scientific learning. Because ultimately, I think we're all here today, right, for the patient. And all of this together will help just get more options to patients faster. Well, I would agree with that. And, and I think it, the key is to have those discussions, to keep an open dialogue during the course. But there is a point to why these trials are being done in the academic or the government public funded. Um, sphere, so there's always going to be an element that <laughs> we don't completely overlap, and and um, I think too, as 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 Christina said, the more we understand sort of some of the the touch points, there are a lot of different ways to approach a problem. There's not just one way to solve it, and um, I think we've seen over the years how we can successfully uh, or have successfully begun to do those things. Um, hopefully, we could do more. Um, but success uh, to us, I think, is, is what really has happened over the past, I'd, I'd say, uh, 12 months where we've had about four to five um, uh, phase three trials that were positive and that were designed as registration intent. Now, they're not all across, <laughs> been totally evaluated. Um, but no. <laughs> um, uh, so I think what we need to do is, is work again on uh, something that's successful, but not as quick as we'd all like to have it, maybe not as streamlined if we were new enough, uh, if we knew now what, what we didn't know back then, um, uh, to, to try to discuss these things. Christy. I think success for me would be being, you know, maximizing the ability to use this academic data because I absolutely agree that these trials are being done in a government-funded or an academic setting. 
um, to capture different information than potentially an industry-led trial is, and the FDA is very interested in that information. So I think that maximizing this data would be wonderful, and if it's being done with registration intent, FDA would, you know, likes to be involved as early and as often as possible and provide as much communication and feedback as we can. So to me, that would communication, feedback, and maximizing the use of this. Great. Congrats. And I would have to agree with Christy. I mean, what we're trying to do is early on come together, uh, understand the fundamentals of the science, um, how do we work together a little bit more effectively, um, and then eventually, hopefully, you know, provide drugs in a quicker methodology to our patients. Right. And finally, Samita. So Dr. Burton only and Dr. Caleb mentioned that they want to transform clinical trials, and we share that vision. And I think success to us looks like um, that we all work together to remove some of the obstacles we discussed today to expedite treatments for patients and couple things. First, if we all can put our uh, mind together to see if there's an investment in the information technology infrastructure at all lengths, NCI, industry, FDA, to be able to receive this data, we have a common system that talks to each other so we can expedite the data submissions. And then second, of course, enhanced collaboration between all stakeholders through the process. Great, thank you, that's a great vision to end on. <laughs> um, so we're, that's just gonna wrap up the discussion with the panelists, but we've, we have about 15 minutes for any questions from the, the in-person audience or um, questions online. I can't really see. Sorry, to the right. Yep. <laughs> can't see over there. Uh, hi, uh, Marty Makrovich from Roche Genentech. Um, it, it's great to hear the, um, some of the longer term vision that people are, are considering here. Um, also wondering what are some very tangible next steps that we might be able to take from this meeting forward? So, Sunita, take a stab at that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, white paper cannot be the culmination of this excellent dialogue and discussion. We agree. Um, you know, I think continued effort by this work stream and more, more s discussion between additional pharma partners, FDA and NC, NC, uh, NCI, uh, to be able to um, advance, uh, you know, some of the obstacles, uh, solve some of the op obstacles we discussed today. Yeah, and there's certainly some things, uh, some of the recommendations are, can be implemented right away. I mean, certainly, you know, engaging and making decisions around, you know, that doesn't take a whole work stream. I mean, individual companies working on their own processes to make better decisions or clear decisions about intent of the data. I mean, certainly those are things that we can do right away. I think the, the, the um, elements that you outlined in, in your sort of future success, you know, aligning databases, that those are long-term visions. And so, you know, that's gonna take a lot of work. So there's certainly some near-term things that we can we can implement right away. I think I would just add, if, if you're an industry sponsor working with an academic group, like an NCTN group, and you're not connecting, start <laughs> connecting right now. <laughs> like, it's never too early to, to meet with us. Okay. I think there's someone to the left yeah, here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> hi, I'm, I'm Kyle from Red Cap Cloud. And, uh, you know, bravo. I'm, I'm kind of humbled and, uh, and, and thankful to be here. But um, I don't know, you know, many of you probably know Red Cap. I mean, a lot of the databases and the, and the data we're talking about here is primarily generated out of REDCap because um, it's a free tool to cancer centers and to academia to use. Um, part statement, part question back to the pragmatic question and what you're talking about is that it's not only data that we see that's important, it is method, and especially in the, in the screening and diagnostic pathway. And I think there's an opportunity to, to not only just look at the data but look at repurposing what academic centers are doing to test patients, to get them through, to consent them, um, let them use the tools that they're using. So, um, because it's embedded in the care path, and that's kind of what we were talking about earlier, is trying to be, you know, pragmatic approaches that are part of the part of the care path. So, um, the question is, you know, are the panels or the pragmatic group, or is this group not only looking at data, but how to how to allow the cancer centers to continue using the tools that they have, you know? instead of maybe dictating that, you know, that they use some off-the-shelf tool that's, that's hard for them to adopt. Um, but 
you know, again, very thankful that uh, these are the topics that are coming about because I think at the end of the day, this is why, part, partly why 95% of patients aren't, aren't getting on trials because it's not just the data, it's the process um, around a specific uh, program. And it's getting more and more complex. So we need tools that can rapidly ad adapt to a specific diagnostic pathway and, and whatever else is required uh, to get that patient on the therapy. I'm not sure, so I'm trying to tease out the question in there, so I, I heard I some the, recommendations. The specific question would be, are you, are you not only looking at the data, but looking at how to repurpose um, specific processes that a, that a cancer center might have adopted for your, you know, maybe for a merck Serono drug or for something else, because there's, there's value not only in the data, but in, for any given study, repurposing maybe a specific consent process or a specific screening process that might not have been described you know, well enough in the protocol or broken out well enough in the protocol for, uh, for adoption into, the, into that specific study or for that specific program. Yeah, do you want to So I can address it. I think um, that's why we need closer, uh, more discussion while the study is ongoing, mapping the terms, preparing for a safety update. It's not just the database lock and filing the initial submission. It's the uh, time, time of the adverse event and the duration, the concomitant medications. All the things are what FDA requires. We submit <laughs> those and those are not necessarily collected. So we have to adapt some of these systems um, and talk about these systems because these only surface at the end of the trial. Thanks. Um, to the right here. Yeah, I just wanted to, so, well, this is Paul Clutes from the, from the OCE. I wanted to say um, that this was the panel I was most interested in, honestly, today, because this seems like one of those tactically doable um, mm -hmm. situations where there's a couple of key challenges that you guys have identified. And there's been a couple of friends panels that have then launched into more of a longitudinal, um, you know, multi-stakeholder sort of effort that I think this might need. And I think you, you said it well when you said, you know, can we just sit down with commercial data folks, FDA data folks, and uh, sites and figure out how to do it right from the beginning? That's one challenge, et cetera. But I think about the eligibility criteria work. Um, I think about translating the pro-CTCAE, that was a longitudinal effort that came from a friends panel. So I, I would just urge this not to be the last discussion and to really try to meet and figure this out because we know that cooperative group trials are a really huge opportunity that we're underutilizing um, and that this seems like something that we could tactically do if we didn't let it go at a white paper and continued longitudinally. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I think the... Um white paper really lends itself um, to um, some focused solutions and when you look at the recommendations and I think you picked up on that you know there's certainly things that then we can pick up and move forward and we, we did we made an effort to really identify um, tangible things that we can do um, and and to your point and that's why I say, so we don't want to, and to Marty's question earlier it doesn't end with the white paper. It certainly needs to be, okay, we did all this work to unearth some of the challenges. We've put in place some re a really good start on some, some recommendations, solutions, um, but it's gonna take work. It's gonna take work to dig through the details, so um, we'll, we'll look to Mark to <laughs> <laughs> I also Keep think, us. I think that the discussions that we had while we were writing the right paper were some of these discussions where we actually had all this, a lot of people from the different stakeholders sitting down in a room and actually saying, okay, well, you know, I'm from the FDA and this is what I need to do to do my job. And then we had the people from Alliance or the NCI saying, this is what I need to do my job. And then we had industry. And I think that saying the same things, and I think that as we were having those conversations, we actually came up with a lot of solutions. So I do agree that I think there is a time and a place to continue this conversation and to see where we can have flexibility, where we can have collaboration to, mm. to solve some of these problems. Yeah, I want to add to that because for us, it's operationalizing it. When we get the request, we struggle with our policies and we really need something that really works for pharma and incorporates what the NIH needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's actually very, and Christine and I had a bit of an exchange when we were working on this. We, we look at a 12 month and you can almost figure out if you just did this, that would probably shave off three months off of that. And if yeah. you just did this, <laughs> that would be another month. And so it was, it was easy to sort of map some of these things to tangible gains in the timeline. So I agree, we shouldn't really be dropping the ball. We should be moving forward and, and mm -hmm. getting this um, in place. So. 
Hello, Joanna Pauls, uh, Regulatory Affairs, Regeneron. So first of all, thank you for a very informative panel, dedicating your time, doing the um, hard work, and, and then sharing the lessons learned with us. Um, I have a question about thinking internationally, globally, if the panel members have any experience now expanding this to collaborations, academic collaborations and partnerships outside of the U.S., where these partners outside of the U.S. might not have a relationship with the FDA, don't even know how to submit an IND, that they might be experienced in doing CTAs and they think it's, you know, requirements, um, say, in Europe are the same as in the U.S. Um, you know, so that is an, another layer of complexity, and I'm curious if, if we've been thinking in that direction as well. I can start it, and then I'll just ask other people Thank to weigh you. in. I, I think it, um, Genentech Roche, we've actually been exploring connecting the cooperative groups, um, looking at academic drug, drug development from a global standpoint, um, and trying to figure out how do the different cooperative groups partner and work together on one study, bringing in global data. So that's a, it's complicated, and it's gonna be a long effort, and we've been working on it for about a, almost two, two or three years now. Um, but there is some effort there, because you're right, we, we don't run just one region trials, we run multi-regional trials, so we have to really consider um, what, how we're addressing the entire globe if we're gonna do academic trials. So I'm, I'm gonna, Senator or anybody else want to? I, I think um, it's a great question, and I think we also need to engage global regulatory agencies, um, um, you know, uh, on on the data requirements from cooperative group studies. Because while we are having this conversation, candid conversation with the FDA, we need to understand if uh, uh, if the other agencies would be amenable to accepting uh, the data, and sure. if there are other requirements. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Donna Marinucci. I'm the executive director for ECOG Akron, a cooperative group in the NCTN system. And uh, I, I just want to underscore a few things that were said today. One is that, you know, as Dr. Mooney pointed out, uh, registration trials have been very successful in the system, and we have done quite a few successfully over the years. Maybe not as quickly as we could have or might have if there was more collaboration up front as people were suggesting. I think, you know, industry has to take a role here in making certain that there are funding mechanisms available should decision points be made after the fact. Beforehand, certainly it's easier to set up the trial and collect data prospectively, retrospectively not so much, but we, we have overcome quite a few uh, technology issues. CDISC is, a, is very important. CDASH, the systems that we have employed, everything from the Cancer Trial Support Unit through uh, the identification of investigators and in the system, I think the world over is quite envious of. So to take advantage of this is really important, I think, for patients and for industry to take a look at how we could do this in a better way. One of the things that we've done at ECOG Akron is work with industry prospectively. We've shown them our systems. They've given us some very uh, you know, important insight into their systems and how things are done. And we hope that these collaborations are, are gonna be longstanding and across many companies. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. I think you bring up a really important point, and it doesn't have to be at the time that you're trying to do a trial, because everybody's rushed when they're trying to do a trial, and for um, industry to partner and sort of off-cycle, you know, to, <laughs> to, to um, explore these partnerships when there's not so much urgency to look at the, to your point, Donna, um, explore the systems, try and figure that out so you know which which academic groups can you, you can partner with for different types of um, development opportunities. So I think, you know, in really encouraging uh, industry to take advantage of um, exploring this, not just when you have a trial, but maybe when you're thinking about your broader development program, that this might be something that you want to explore. So I think, I can't see this other side, so I think, I think that's the last question. I, we're ending two minutes early, Jeff. I just, I just want to um, wrap up. I want to first of all thank um, the panelists. You guys are great. It's been so much fun working with you. I think we had a lot of 
good ideas. And I really want to especially thank um, Friends of Cancer because this is a topic that um, obviously I'm very passionate about. I think everybody on the stage is very passionate about this. So thank you for prioritizing this and, and putting a focus on this um, for the annual meeting. And I'll turn it over to Jeff. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Uh, Solution-oriented and implementable ideas is what we strive for in these meetings. So thank you guys for uh, your work leading up to today's discussion. Um, I just want to end by thanking all of our panelists and participation, our participants in the work groups. A lot of work has gone into bringing these ideas together, and we certainly appreciate everyone's time and expertise. Um, I absolutely want to thank everyone at Friends of Cancer Research. Thank you for making today a success. All of the work of helping to um, assure that the work groups are making progress and making the meeting today possible. Truly a group of talented individuals, so thank you. And I want to thank everyone for uh, joining in person today and virtually. Um, we had a, a great audience for import, important topics and certainly appreciate your attendance, whether it be here or online. Uh, we have a couple of exciting meetings that are coming up in February, which will be the next time we hope to see you uh, in person, and are happy to ask you to make a note on your calendar that for next year's annual meeting will be held on November 12th, and we hope that you will be able to join us. Please keep an eye out for uh, upcoming information on events into 2024. Travel safely. Thank you for being here, and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you.